Like I said, I've worked my whole life for my music career and my story is a lot to do with my path. So when people can un understand the story, they can understand yeah. of who I am and what I stand for, more than just seeing this white guy doing reggae music. He pulls out a real Mac 10 and that he's aiming it at me. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> A man's bent over and a man well, jumps out worse. of a van yeah. and lands on his bum with his penis and has sex. But it's like jumping out of a van. Yeah, with a van. Out of a van. <laughs> help. Yeah. It's referred to as help. Yeah. yeah. That's what they call it, help. Like Spanish town prison. You wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of people, you you gotta you gotta know what you're doing, because I'm you gotta know what you're doing in there. Because uh, most of the foreigners get extorted. They can't really buy stuff like that. They'll get money taken taken off of them or they gotta let someone look after the money for them or... Yeah. The prison <laughs> weed is not good enough for me. I need a high THC content. I need strong weed, me. I need some real good weed. And the regular prison weed is just bush, it's rubbish. But I got this weed, it was so strong. I stunk out the whole station. <laughs> the policeman, this is while I'm in the jail. The policeman come over and say, yo, you got, you can't smoke that one. Yes, it is all fun and games until a Mac 10's pulled out on you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where um, I thought I was a goner. The world is racing to get back to normal. We all want to meet up again. But after a year of being locked down, it takes time to get back to normal. When we are going through things, we tend to turn to our friends to talk to, but they don't necessarily give us the best advice. We all need help from time to time, and asking for support is a sign of strength. It is not weak. Help is available immediately through Talkspace, who will match your needs with a licensed professional. You could get the help right away. Start feeling better with a single message. Match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com and you will get $100 off your first month if you use the promo code Sean, S-H-A-U-N. That's $100 off when you use the promo code Sean at Talkspace.com. It's part two riot night. <laughs> <laughs> you requested it and what a gentleman Tug of War has been to come back so quickly. Almost 100k views in less than a month on part one. The responses, the feedback, Everyone has just been so lovely and I've been so supportive of what he went through, the hell he went through in the Jamaican prison. And lots of people also have clicked over to his YouTube channel. Last night I was watching some of his music and the charismatic face, the mannerisms, <laughs> waving guns around. Every, you all find it over on his channel. <laughs> yeah. The link is at the top of the description box below the video. <laughs> this evening, we have got Jen co-hosting and Jen is my friend who runs an organic cotton clothing company. Oh, wow. So we will be putting Jen's link in the description box and her Instagram for uh, all the stuff for the company. And we urge you to also support Jen's work. So thanks to everyone who sent questions in for Tug of War as well. Huge thanks for coming back on. You're welcome. Pleasure to be here again. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> I asked you for you to, for like 20 um, possible stories. <laughs> yeah. There's 50. <laughs> we got 50. <laughs> it's mad. Like I was saying, that when I first come, it was it was an amazing, amazing, amazing. I didn't know how it was going to go. So I just, I, you, you you mentioned to me, have you got, what stories you got? And and my head went blank for a minute because I've got so many. <laughs> so I just, we, it was an amazing, I really enjoyed the first podcast we did it was amazing it actually captivated me when i watched it back and everything so but it was a lot of stuff i missed out and i didn't talk about so it's great to come back to do part two the one that struck me the most on this list yeah was something to do with a gate <laughs> to do with who a gate <laughs> act a, oh the gate 
<laughs> that was nothing to do with that. me. <laughs> <laughs> that was an experience I saw in the prison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what happened? What um with, well that was in um South Block in yeah. Spanish Town Prison. I figured we start with a crazy one yeah, before we go back definitely. to the kidnapping. Well, you, you got a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of rules in that prison. Yeah, you got a lot of rules <laughs> on my section that I was in South Block. It was um, a little bit different to the other section on the prison, on the prison, because it had a lot more rules. And if you broke them rules, you'd get either, you get kicked off the section straight away and sent to number one block, which is the the gay block. And in that block there, you'll be, it, it won't be nice for you if you're not gay. <laughs> you understand what I mean? You understand? <laughs> Basically. And um, there was a policeman on our, it was an ex-policeman, he was charged for illegal firearms. I remember correctly. So he was charged for illegal firearms and he was on our sex. He was on, he was like five cells away from me. And everyone, yo, because like we sort of take the piss out of police. Oh, he's a policeman over there. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, oh, you're locked up now with us sort of thing. You know what I mean? So we knew he was a policeman and he was a dodgy policeman, you could tell. And he was in there for some sort of illegal firearms, bigger guns than he was supposed to have as a policeman. Of course. Anyway, it was rumored that um, he was in cell. I think it was a foreigner in his cell and a couple, it was about four people in his cell. And it was rumored that he filled up one of the guys in his cell. <laughs> and like this, yeah. And um, and I think it got verified and then they, they beat the shit out of him. And then he got kicked off of the section and sent to number one block. And Got then you. we all know what happened to him over there. Yeah. <laughs> he held on very tightly to the soul. Yeah, he very, very, you know what it was? I don't think, oh God, I wouldn't even like to think. It's, it's too early. <laughs> nah, too early. All right, so last time we, we had like, it was in chronological order mostly and we got like the main stories. So this time we're gonna fill in a lot of the blanks, get a bit more about his childhood adventures and more about his dad because his dad became this hero. Yeah. When I was watching it again in the live chat and listening to the, st I got the story about your dad just got me so gripped, man. Yeah, I, I to, that's why yeah. I had to go back and... Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to say something as well. It's, um, it's only in recent years I've come to terms to be able to talk about everything. Not not come to terms to it, but it's yeah. it's such a real part. It's something that I didn't even want to remember. Every, it's something that you move on with your life. Don't you? Because I don't like these places, like Spanish Town Prison, you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. You understand what I'm saying? So when you come out there, you really do move forward and, and forget about it. And do you try not forget? You therapy. can't forget about it. Say again? Almost therapy, though, going back to it. Do you not find? Um, I wouldn't say therapy. Sometimes it can be a bit daunting. Yeah. Really Sometimes it can be a bit daunting. Um, yeah. I'll be honest with you. Like what I said, it's only in recent years. I did an album called Spanish Town which I did, music, I did a whole musical album about yeah. my experience in Spanish Town. And I did that in 2018. I got locked up in 2002. Yeah, it took, took me that long, that long yeah, yeah. to write about it. Yeah. It took me that long to write about it for the simple fact it does um, have a crazy effect on you. Yeah. It sticks with you for life. And, you know, it, it takes... Having time, to live time is a he yeah, time yeah, is a so, healer. Yeah. As well. You know what I mean? It's, and it's like, raw for years, isn't it? It's raw for years. But then it's therapeutic later on. Yeah. 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 I, then I suppose you're right. It does become sort of therapeutic later yeah. on. And it, it and it is who I am. It. It's yeah. who I am. It's what I am. I can't hide from the fact. I'll give you an example. When I first come out of prison, talking uh, um and being trying to be a music uh, running around the music industry and introducing myself to producers. And most yeah. of the music industry in Jamaica, they're not gangster. They're not, they're just musicians. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I remember I was with a very popular artist at the time, a good friend of mine and, and Mr. Lex. And he said to me, don't tell them, don't tell anyone about the prison. You know, so it's something I didn't even want to advertise. Yeah. And even get, because I thought it would have, um, done more harm than good for my career oh people won't want to sign me because they think i'm a convict i stop me from getting money deals stuff like that yeah you know so that was in the early part where i didn't want to talk about it that much to maybe hidden me you understand what i'm saying or maybe dam like damage me moving forward of course you understand what i'm saying but it is who i am 
It's like just before you get out, you're thinking, yeah. will I be able to get a job? Will people find out I've got a criminal record? Exactly. Will I get a girlfriend? Will this people avoid what, me and yes. cross the road from me? Yes. Because it's scary, isn't it, for the normal people? This yeah. guy's been in a foreign prison. That's right. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And you say, and when you say it to people, they can look at you a whole different way as well. Yeah. You know, so it's it's nice now, years later. That's why I said, even with the music. Yeah. It took me, and I, and I write about, and my music is all about stuff I've experienced more or less, or stuff I've been around. And it took me that long to write about it. Well, at least it helps with your music, I guess. Yeah, oh, it, it definitely, <laughs> yeah. It took me, and that's because of my father and it's so close to my heart and it's such real pain experiences that yeah. I went through. And, but yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. It's like what you said, time's a healer and it is therapeutic. Yeah. And it's, and it is who I am. I am who I am. And I can't change what self, happened. You know? It made me who I am today. Like yeah. I said, on the, on the, it made me stronger. It made me who I am. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we can't, we can't change that. No. Let's give us like, I mean, I consider myself just like a normal person. Yeah. But you go for an extraordinary environment. Yeah. And it's just, it gives you a story then, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can draw on that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, all right, so we're going to go back to your younger years yeah. then. So at 16, yeah. there was a situation over 50 pounds worth of weed. <laughs> it wasn't actually weed. It was 50 pounds. Oh, just 50 pounds. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, that was actually, I was, I, was, I was at home and I was only 16 years old and I was, I was starting to sell weed at the time and I was like popular in my community. And I had some friends used to come around and see me. And one of my friends on the way, I used to live in a three-story house. So on the way down from that, on the way down from, he used to come up to my top room, I was in the bedroom. And on his way down, my mum was in the living room and on the ground floor in the kitchen, we had a bowl of money. We were like pound coins and stuff we used to use to go to the shop. My mum and dad would put money in there. And um, my mum heard the, the bowl jingling. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, my mum heard the bowl jingling <laughs> when it was. So she called up. She says, "Who just left the house?" <laughs> and I'm says, "My friend. I, I don't even want to say his name to embarrass him. But I just say, my, my friend Red Tete, -te, and he says, uh, the jingle. whoever's left the house has just gone in the kitchen and taken money out of the bowl.' And I'm like, you're joking me. And I'm like, wow, I couldn't believe it was him because he's my. He's actually was my neighbour. Oh, right. He lived on the same road as oh, me. Slice. And he come from a very wealthy family. His house was, was like just the nicest thief. house on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I swear I couldn't get it. If it was someone poor, I would might have even not even looked at it too. He was like from a wealthy family. What the hell are you going in my kitchen stealing? <laughs> Money for. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think it was fifty quid. It was in pound coins. I couldn't get. I couldn't. I couldn't get my head around it. I'm only sixty. I couldn't get my head around it. Like his, his house, they had it all converted. Like they got double glazing windows. Like they was. They was rich. You come from riches. I couldn't get my head around it. Anyway, I was like, I said, no, nah, you ain't getting away with that. So I was like. My dad's, um, my dad at the time used to run a trimming merchant business. He's still Papa cottons. Wall. It's funny how you sell. Oh, really? Yeah, to, oh, yeah. so I, I grew up around cottons and zips and shoulder pads and hangers and everything you can Too imagine stylish. to make women's garments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so like we used to run it and he used to have drivers. So he had like four drivers. Yeah. And um, I used to be friendly with the drivers and I asked one of them, I told one of them about the situation. I said, like, I want to kidnap this guy. So I ended up, we ended up, I said to him, he's my mate, remember? I just waited to kidnap him and give him a you beat. You didn't try him, calling him first taking it a or bit. something. Hmm? You didn't end up calling him first or... No, I called no, him. We, I tricked him. <laughs> I said, we're going for a drink to Epping Forest. Right. I said, we're going to a party. <laughs> Christ's sake. I said, we're going to Epping. I said, there's a lovely bar and there's a pool table. What? I like, when you're 16, that's what you want to do. You want to go pubs, play, play pool, pool, stuff like that. Yeah. So I say, like, yeah. there's girls down there. There's this pub down in Epping Forest. I know it well. Like, my friend told me about it. My dad, my dad, I've got a driver to drive a stand. So the guy who worked for my dad, him and his girlfriend had the van. So yeah. we all jumped in the back of the van, him, his girlfriend, me, the guy, another two of us, and drove towards it. Like, we're all pretending to go for this Jolly Boys outing. <laughs> By the kid. time we hit the motorway, <laughs> <laughs> I just started beating the shit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, so we got there and I started torturing him and I threw him in the river. And I How did you torture him? I well, I just, I just started, like, really just beating him up and I was picking up sticks and telling him to fetch it and I threw him in the river. <laughs> and I was really bad. 
Mm-hmm. I was really bad. Pinch your yeah, here. Yeah, the first half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, and then my friends had to I was, I, I probably would have done something worse than that to say, no, leave him. I, my plan was to beat him up and leave him there. But I must right. have beat him up so bad. My friends felt sorry for him and begged for me to bring him back to Hackney. So I said, okay. But I ended up convincing me. He said, no, we can't leave him here. And it's a good thing because if I left him there, he probably would have called police on me <laughs> and I would have got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was, so it was better. We, so we took him back. And uh, yeah, that was that was whatever. And as quite ha- often happens with these situations. It's, it happened quite a they lot. They come back to us. Boomerang. They do. Boomerang. It's karma. karma. Yes. yes. Boomerang. yes. Yes. And then there was a sequence of you getting kidnapped. Yeah. Yeah. That was my karma for that. <laughs> at 18. <laughs> at yeah, 18. 18. Yeah. At gunpoint. Yeah. What was the circumstances? Well, I just started selling weed. Not started selling. I was selling weed for about since 16 years old. And by the time I reached 18, I was starting to move kilos. So I became a... I just started building up a name for myself in the area. And I'm very young to be moving the way I'm moving. And I'm doing it by myself and everything. And the rubber guys in Hackney must have got the gist of what I'm doing, you know what I mean? So I was coming back from, I went to see a girl, I remember. And I came back for like three o'clock in the morning. So I've, and my house is like, it's got a driveway and we got a metal gate. So I've come back three o'clock in the morning from seeing some girl and I've parked up and I've walked towards my gate and my first, and I've heard four people running up towards me and I thought it was police because I was very active selling weed. So I thought, oh fuck, police are raiding me, I'm fucked. Yeah. As they start running closer, I'm seeing balaclavas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear, and I'm at the gate, cause I've got a gate in front of them. I'm at the gate with my key. So as they start running closer, I'm seeing balaclavas. I'm looking again, I'm like, oh, that ain't police. <laughs> police don't wear balaclavas. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, oh shit. So like, it was four of them. Three of them had bal- balaclavas, one of them didn't. And my my house like had a uh, like a hallway, so once you go in, you can't really see what's going on because it's like a little small alleyway before you get to the sorry, a little passageway before you get to the door. Mm. Anyway, so they've run up towards me, and one of them's had a gun. One of them's like a big Rambo knife, right? And put the Rambo knife to my throat, and the other ones put the gun to me and told me to open the fucking door. So you opened the fucking door. I opened the fucking door. <laughs> my dad's inside the house, sleeping. Yeah. My dad's sleeping, it's three o'clock in the morning. My dad is a very, very heavy sleeper. When he's, <laughs> <coughs> when he's sleeping, <coughs> he, he ain't waking up. You got, it's got to be, a, it could be world war going on out there. Honestly, a tram could go into my house, I wouldn't wake up. Yeah. It's, it's, that, yeah. it's a good, it's, you know what? It's, it's a good way to sleep because some people can't sleep, right? Yeah. Some people have problems sleeping. <laughs> I have no problem sleeping. My dad was a very deep sleeper. so. We're inside the house, so they've pushed me into the, I had no choice but to open the gate. I've gone into the house now. It was a very bad day. They caught me because I didn't actually have anything around me. I had about 80 pounds cash, a pair of scales, and about a quarter ounce of weed. I was just, I was just re, li, literally run out, you know? And, and at the time I was 18, I was spending my money stupid. So I didn't even have much money around me either. So I just, at the time they run up on me at a very bad time. You picked a bad day. There's nothing here. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. They weren't trying to hear that. They weren't believing me. They weren't trying to hear. So they've gone up into my dad's still sleeping. I can hear him snoring. They're in the house. They've got me at gunpoint, knife point. They've taken me up into the living room. I'm like, here, look, I've got his fucking skills. 80 pound cash. Mm. Hardly any weed. They say, no. Now I used to hang around a lot of my friends with doing um were drug dealers as well. And some of them used to do, like I said, I never did hard drugs business, but my friends did. And they knew, I had some very close friends who were doing a lot of that sort of business and was doing a big turnover. And they knew who I was hanging around. They knew who I was close to. And they were like, okay, if you ain't got nothing, we, we want you to set up your friends. So they took me from the house at gunpoint into my own car. So they kidnapped me in my own car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. smart. Yeah, it was like, I remember it was a Mondeo. I just bought it. Oh, I'll never buy a Mondeo again. It's my bad luck car. I swear. Yeah. So, so they wasn't satisfied with the with the um, the eighty pound and the scales and what, no, they was like, no, it's four of them that weren't gonna cut it. It was like, okay, where's my where's um I don't want to say the names. But where's your friend live? Where's that friend live? And where's that friend live? And I'm like, I, I don't know. 
I'm not saying, I, I'm, I don't give up my friends for nothing. You have to kill me. So they've ended up kidnapping me and took me to Cattle Estate in Leighton. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that estate. It's got a massive underground car park. It's in a very run-down estate. And it's got a massive car, um, car, underground car park. And they drove, I, I recognize this thing because I knew some guys who lived there at the time. So um, when they drove me, they drove me under the car park. They've kind of put me on some chair under the car park and they've got me at gunpoint and they're threatening me now to give information on where my friend's girlfriend lives because he knew, they knew where his mum lived. But he wasn't staying at his mum's house. They, he was staying at his girl's house. Yeah. And they, they wanted to know where the girl lives. So they've got me at gunpoint saying, where's, I said, I don't know. I said, you're going to have to kill me, literally. Honestly, yeah. And um, I thought I was going to be a gunner, to be honest with you. And I just started calling some names of some guys who I was doing work for at the time. And I think- Did you not give out fake addresses or- No. I would have gone straight to that, man. <laughs> no, I didn't. I said, I didn't know because it was the girlfriend. So I just, yeah. I don't know where his girlfriend lives. Sorry. I did. Yeah, of course. But, but... I don't. You ask me where the girlfriend, his girlfriend lives. I don't know where his fucking girlfriend lives. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, That's what yeah. I'm saying. To, I don't know. Simple like that. And um, I ended up calling, I thought I was going to be a god. I ended up calling names of some guys I was working for at the time. And I think one of the names must have ring a bell with them and they didn't really want to. When I called someone's name and they realized I was working with him, I could see they didn't want to touch me no more. You understand what I'm saying? So they actually dropped me back to Hackney. Oh, lovely. Yeah, well, they, they took the car. <laughs> oh, yeah, in my own car. <laughs> Chauffeur driven. Yeah, yeah. Chauffeur driven. Oh, and they dropped sorry. me to Mare Street. And I walked home. It was like, and I walked home from there. So I made it out alive. Papa Wall was oh. still sleeping. My car was gone. <laughs> my scales were gone. And my last 80 quid. And I nearly <laughs> lost my life. But I was all right. <laughs> <laughs> and Papa was still sleeping. Yeah. So I had to go back and say, Dad, <laughs> you know what happened last night? <laughs> And he's like, what happened? I'm like, Nick, was, he, he, these, nothing really bothered my dad. He was like, really? He said, you're joking. <laughs> you're joking. Oh, can't we crack on with it next day now. Nice, <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think that must have been my karma for yeah. kidnapping that guy. And that was, I, oh, man. My life's a movie. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if any of our podcast guests were involved in um, what happened to you. There's um, a rival podcaster, Ooh. first name Marvin, was involved in a lot of that kind of activity, kidnapping, okay. robbing people. It could have been. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so, though. All right. Yeah. Next one, then, yeah. is a year later, yeah. it, you kidnapped karma wasn't quite no. deleted. No. <laughs> No. Because at, at age 19, <laughs> it's very true, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, man. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Rise of the Foot Soldier that had the Turks in it, the, the movie, James? I think so. Rise of the Foot Soldier, was it the Turks? It, it, it were quite heavy, heavy mob in that. Yeah. Yeah. Was it? The Turks. Mm. I think it, they were the heavy mob in that, weren't they? I think so. I thought it was the Essex. I think so. I thought, you know, I watched yeah, that. but the Essex were scared of the Turks. Yes. All oh, right, yeah. No, yeah. They were? They were like worry of them. Worry the of the Turks. In, the, in that movie. Turks. In that movie. Yeah. I, I the Turks were heavy duty characters in that movie, weren't they? I'm sure they was. Yeah. I'm sure they was. But well, the Turks come into your life yeah. at age 19. Yes, oh, they did. Yeah. <laughs> Many of them. I've grown up with Turkish people all my life. Big up all my Turkish friends. <laughs> yeah. So, how did you come to get kidnapped by Turks? This is a whole deal gone wrong. <laughs> Does it start with weed? Yeah. Business. <laughs> yeah, it starts with weed business. Oh, man. <laughs> now, kids, kids, do you see what weed businesses lead to? <laughs> it don't lead to nothing good. <laughs> <laughs> These videos are educational with life lessons for young people. Yes. We are not glamorizing crime. No. <laughs> we don't at all. No. Exactly. And you know, that's the thing about it. I'm not proud of any of this stuff. This yeah. is just, I mean, we laugh about it now, but yeah. this ain't stuff to be proud of. <laughs> no, but you it's know, what I'm, people want to hear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it may, so? it, yeah, it's life experiences. And exactly. it is. this is Thanks a highlight so. for people to know, don't do this life because this is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You don't want to go down this road, trust me. We're smiling because we're still alive. Yeah, that's why we're smiling. <laughs> Thank you. Because of, I can't believe we made it here. I, I can't believe I'm here with you. <laughs> Same here. I'm not meant to be with you now. Obviously not. And you're not probably meant to be with me. 
<laughs> and neither are you. And Jen. Jen. <laughs> we are all here. We're lucky. Yeah, we are. We are. <laughs> we are. All right, so set the table with the Turks then. Yeah. Oh. Right. So my friend had some weed from Jamaica, really cheap. He said, he phoned me up. He says, Taga, <laughs> I got some killer high grade. 1,300 pound a key. Now that's really good because we sell this by the pound and the key is two and a quarter pound. So I'm like, oh, wow, that sounds good. Let me come around and have a look at this weed. So you say for a kilo, 1,300 pounds for a kilo. He says, yeah, 1,300 pounds for a kilo. So I go around and see it. So I know this guy at the time, he wants weed high grade. He's mad over buying high grade and he's willing to pay anything as long as it's the proper quality. He don't mind. He'll pay three grand a key. A key. He'll pay 3,500 a key as long as it's the, the quality he's looking for. So I went around and saw the weed. I thought, yeah, this is really good Jamaican weed. So I let my guy know, yo, I got the good thing, you know. So I told him 2,700. So that's quite a nice bit of profit for me, right? Yeah. What's that like? <laughs> 1,200 pound profit, something like that. So I said, I got, I got the killer for you. I knew he, that's what he was paying at the time. So I wasn't really overcharging because that was the going rate. It was that yeah. I was, he would, I said, you pay, how much you paying? 2,700, I've got the killer for you, 2,700. Don't worry about what I'm getting it for. Bye. He says, yeah, I want it. So he comes with his 2,700 pound. I said, it drive me around the corner. So he, the guy I was getting it from was like a couple roads away from me. So I drove him and I drove him and I parked him up like a road away from his house. So he wouldn't see where I'm going. So he gave me the 2,700. I don't want to go into my friend's house now with the 2,700 to let him know how much money I'm making out of this deal. <laughs> so there's a pub outside his house called the Shakespeare. And I end up going to the pub and going to the toilet and separate the money. And I take 1,500 pound out and I hide the rest in my pants. Obviously. And I've gone up. Okay, and I say, I've pretended I've got 1,500 for the day and I'm making 300 pound profit instead of 1,200. You understand what I'm saying? Because if I start letting him know I'm making 1200, he's gonna want a bit more money. So I'm like, nah, nah, you know, you know what I'm getting. So I've gone up there and say, hey. So he said, all right, give me the money. I'll be back in half an hour. Now I trust him, he's my friend, no problem. I said, right, give him the money. I have a little like, extra 100 quid for you, drink. Because look, I made 30, that's like, a little 100 quid there, drink. Everything. Anyway, so half an hour pass, he don't come. I'm sitting in his house. Why not? <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> One hour passes. I phoned him. I said, Joe, where are you? Oh, I'm soon come to I'm on my way. I got it. I'm on the way. Two hours passes. <laughs> the guy's outside the house waiting around the corner. He's going mad now after two hours. He's like, where is this guy? What are you doing? You're robbing me. I'm like, no, calm down. Everything's all right. He's just, he's just a little bit delayed. Don't worry. It's Jamaican people timing. Keep your calm. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what I was trying to, trying to break it down to. I said, don't worry, it's on the way. Everything's fine. It's just a little bit of a delay. I'm really upset with him as well. He's taking long, but I've spoke to him. He's not like he's not answering his phone. He's answering his phone. He's just yeah. taking fucking forever here. Long. Two hours turn into three hours. <laughs> right. Three hours turn into four hours. Now, I don't know, but by the fourth hour, he must have... Now, what happened was he kind of followed me to see where I was going. I didn't know he knew where I was going. Right. So I've got him parked two roads away. And I ain't even gone back to the car. I'm just phoning him and saying, motherfucker, wait. I'm waiting. I can't do nothing but wait. No. And I'm going mad on my friend right now. I said, where the fuck are you, man? This guy's outside your ass two roads away waiting. I want to get out of here. He's driving me nuts. Where are you with this fucking weed? Please, come on. Four hours, five hours. He must have called out that. This guy... He wasn't the biggest of lads and he wasn't really, um, I don't think he could have really done much by himself. So he must have felt it by the five hours gone now, he must have felt, and it's the first time he's done business with me. So by the five hours passed, he thought, oh, this guy's trying to rob me. So he was in contact with a, lot, with a Turkish mob. Right. So he's phoned up his Turkish mob and these guys have pulled up about five cars then. <laughs> like, I'm only 19 years old at the time and he's like, oh, like, like, they're like late 20s, 30s. There's like a whole Turkish mob, like five cars, bimmers, mercs have pulled up now. And they've half kicked down my man. They found out where I am and they've all half forced me. They've half not, not kicked down the door, but I've had to let them in because they know where I am. And they're all in the house waiting with me. So everyone's in his flat now. He's got a <laughs> <Right>. studio flat. <laughs> <laughs> We're all there. I'm there with the with the guy. I've got the weed. For, give me the money and his mob. 
<laughs> Pressure. Pressure. <laughs> and I'm on the phone like, Joe, where the fuck are you, Joe? I'll say Joe, because Joe, you did me wrong for this. You know this. <laughs> Joe, where the fuck are you? Tug, I'm coming. And if I ever meet you, if I ever introduce you to Joe, this is a nightmare person to deal with. I'm coming. <laughs> I'm on the way. The <laughs> soon come. I'm like, Joe, I'm up in your yard with about 10 Turks. These men are, oh, with blood. They're angry. Blood. You need to get here with this weed now. Cause I don't know what's gonna happen here next. They're all losing their patience in the house. He ain't even got, he's only a studio flat. He's got two turntables. He was a DJ at the time, jungle DJ. Yeah. <coughs> he's got two turntables, television. It's not a lot in there. Did you so, actually ever find out where he was? What took him so long? After? Um, yeah. No, other than him just taking the fucking piss. There was no reason for him to be taking so long. No, he was probably just there listening because he was listening to reggae music, dub plates on you because there was all music guys as well he was dealing with. So they're just there probably so fucking bad. around. Girls, music, I don't know. Nothing important. Nothing. Nothing important. So I'm like, I'm, I said, I'm on the way. I'm on the way. Five hours. They're fed up awaiting that. They're all like, no, you're coming. I'm like, you're coming with us. I said, what do you mean coming with you? I ain't got nowhere with you. What the fuck are you talking about? Anyway, it starts getting a bit nasty with me and them in the flat. And um, one of them tries to hit me and I start fighting all these guys in the flat. The whole flat starts getting trashed. I'm throwing speakers at them. <laughs> it's on the first floor. It's on top of a pub. Remember the Shakespeare pub? It's yeah. on top of the pub. So there's a long stairways. It's one of them sort of flats that's situated on top of pubs. Yeah. So there's a long stairway going up. Yeah. And they're trying to get me to the stairway to throw me down the stairway. That's why I'm fighting them. Because they're trying to get me, they're trying to get me out the flat. They're trying to kidnap me. They're trying to take me out of this flat. So I'm fighting them, but there's too many of them. There's like seven Turks and the guy, and it's too, it's all against me. Yeah. And I'm throwing them. The whole house is getting, <laughs> I swear, it's something out of a movie. You wouldn't believe it. The house is trash. Like I'm throwing the TV at them. The Turks take it. The speaker. They're massive. Some of the Turks are like that. They're six foot tall. They're grabbing me. I swear it was nuts. They're punching me everything. Yeah. They finally get the better of me. It's inevitable. I'm not going to be able to get the better of these guys. They get the better of me at the end and they end up throwing me down the stairs. Not I mean, I'm a big guy. I was like, I was big, big as a kid as well. I was like 18 stone, 17 stones, a big Damn. kid. Yeah. They threw me down the fucking stairs. Wow. <clears throat> I got thrown down the stairs. I got, they had a gun on them as well. One of them come with a sort of, one of them come with a gun and forced me in the car. So right. I've got two of them. I'm in the middle of, a, I'm in the back of a Benz now. And one of them's got a gun and they got two of them. They've got these like squash. I'm in the middle of the back seat and there's one at each side. And there's one in the front. And there's two cars, there's other cars, convoys of them, and they've drove me and they're driving me off that. <laughs> oh God, I've left the house. <laughs> I'm driving down Green Lanes. I remember I'm driving down Green Lanes. I'm like, where the fuck are you guys taking me? You know what I mean? We're going. I said, he's coming back. He said, he ain't coming back. I said, where are we going? <laughs> they ain't talking. Oh shit. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> we didn't get far. By the time we got to Green Lanes, about five minutes in the car, yeah. the phone rings. It's Joe. I said, Joe. I said, Tugger, where are you? <laughs> I said, what do you mean, where am I? They've taken me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's still there living it up. <laughs> I said, what do you fucking mean, where am I? They've taken me. Where are you? <laughs> well, where, where, where I am? Was he there? I'm in the back of a car <laughs> being kidnapped. Christ's sake. I'm literally, I'm in the car. There's one guy, there's one Dave's that I'm like that. They're massive. I could just about fit in there. <laughs> They're squashing me up in the back. One of them's got a gun like that because I'm fighting. It's, I swear to God. Yeah. I'm like, Joe, where the fuck are you, man? Where the fuck are you? I'm dead, Tugger. <laughs> I'm, he's acting angry on the phone. What the fuck's going on? I think he's got back to the house and seen the fuck up. Yeah, <sighs> seen the Yo, he's gone mad because yeah. he's got back to his flat and saw his whole flat trash. Absolute chaos. Yeah, no, his flat's gone. Like, it's destroyed. Like, everything in the flat. The kettle got thrown. Everything. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> The flat is no good. You have to refurbish this now. Fuck's <laughs> sake. <laughs> 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 yeah. Serious shit. So, that's why he phones me. I'm, I'm on the phone, I said, Top. I said, Where are you? You got the weed? I got the weed, he says. <laughs> right. You sure you? I got the fucking weed. Where are they? I want to see them. He's acting like he wants to fight them. I'm like, Joe, you don't want to fight these guys. Just give them their fucking weed. 
So we and let I release me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <clears throat> Bang. I'm like, yo, Nick, he's got it. He's there, he's there. Let's do a U-turn. <laughs> Come on, turn around. <laughs> That's it, they do a U-turn. We drive back to the flat. I feel a bit better because I'm fighting these guys by myself. I need at least one friend with me here, <laughs> you know? So we drive back. I, I, I remember, I'll never forget pulling up on the road. And he's outside. <laughs> I pulled up on the road. This guy's a nutcase. And he's outside the road in the middle of the street waving his hand. What the fuck? Guy, no! <laughs> <laughs> and we pull up on the cars and it's him one. And he's got the weeds in his shoulder. Like he's wearing a jacket and the weeds in the shoulder of the jacket. He's got the, we can see it, it's sticking out, this big lump of weed. He's got it like, imagine you have a, it was a fucking movie. He's got, he's got the weed in the shoulder, half that is sticking out. <laughs> and he's like jumping up and down in the middle of the road. This is before, that's what I'm saying. Thank God, like cameras changed everything in Hackney. This yeah. is before cameras. <laughs> anyway, oh, brilliant. I pull up, we pull up. As soon as I get out of the car, we start fighting again instantly. <laughs> I feel like, more or less, so we're kicking off in the middle of the street now and I've run over to him like, yeah, come on, he cunts. You understand what I'm saying? But not really, because one of them's got a gun, so I'm like, bro, let's just get the fucking, <laughs> give them the weed Do and the get exchange. the fuck out. Like, get no, Joe, it. I'm like going to Joe, where's the weed? Like, but he's acting like he don't want to give them the weed because the house is fucked up. So he's got the weed, he said, you fucked on my flat. <laughs> you fucked on my flat. <laughs> He said, where's the weed? I've got the weed, I've got the weed, but you fucked up a flat. So he wants, he's kicking off and I said, Joe, you're five hours late. <laughs> we could have flown to fucking... Amsterdam. I'm, I'm back. Christ. You're five hours late, Joe. They got a right to be upset, the guys. They don't know me, Joe. They've given me 2,000. They doesn't know the amount. Like, oh, shit. We don't want to give, we're going to get, it's going to get to that story now. This is, it makes even worse. So, oh, yeah, so we're outside the thing now. And then he says, so we, we sort of squashed the argument outside. It's okay, let's all get out. Let's just go upstairs and sort this out. So we've gone back upstairs now. It's calmed down a little bit. We got, because we got the goods. We got what they want, right? So everyone's calmed down a little bit now. They can see that it ain't a robbery because they must have thought initially that the guys just run off. They're taking me now. No, that wasn't the case. Joe was just taking fucking forever. <laughs> <laughs> Honest intentions. Honest intentions. <laughs> With good intentions. Yes. So Joe, so like we end up going back up to the flat. When we get back up to the flat, he pulls out the weed. It's a pound of weed. Okay. They're paid for a kilo. <laughs> a pound of weed is 16 ounces. A kilo is 36 ounces. Joe's pulled out the weed and says, here. I said, what's that? I even looked small when I saw it. I saw it, I was thinking about it. I didn't see it properly in his shoulder. So when he's pulled out, he said, what's that? I said, here. He said, that's a part. I said, what's that? He said, 16. He said, the man's gone mad straight away. Because they've been they're, they're waiting five, five hours now for 16 ounces. And like, what do you mean it's fucking pounds? A kilo one. And then Joe said, Told I told you 1,500 pound a pound. He said 15. Fuck it. Fuck it. Then he says, what? 15, the, then the guy I sold the weed to says 1,500 pounds. He gets upset and tries to punch me in the face. As soon as he punched me in the face, I said, fuck you, cunt, bang. Hit him back. That was it. Kicked off again straight away. <laughs> Then the war starts again. Oh, busy night. The flat gets fucked up all over again. The speakers get picked off off the floor. Bro, the, kettle. the kettle. The kettle. There's a record there. <coughs> Everything. We start brawling again in the oh. flat now over that. I'm like, oh, fucking hell. I'm like, there's no end to this. There's no end to this. And the guy's found out about the money situation now because that's why we're fighting again now. And he's like, I'm like, pussy, it's not your problem. It's not your business how much i'm paying for it yeah but i suppose because they waited the five hours and this is just getting from bad to worse and just gets worse yeah. and then you know it's just sounding worse and worse to them so i end up after the fighting and we're fed up of fighting there's no end to this so the only was resolution to it <laughs> was i because they know about the money now because that's fucked it all up i didn't mind fighting the whole day as long as i go home with my motherfucking profit <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? I was like, we'll do this all day. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, in my, I've got the fucking money in my, I'm in my pants. You ain't getting this, but you've just spoiled it now because you've exposed the deal. So they know I've got the money. 
So I'm like, the only way out of this now, I went in the toilet, I took out the money. <laughs> I had to like level off the rest of the money for what? You know, because they only brought half the weed. Yeah. So I had to balance it out. Did you make anything? Uh, it didn't. <laughs> I, I don't. I think so. A couple hundred, I think. I think it wasn't. It wasn't worth it. No. It was, <laughs> <laughs> I went home bruised up. <clears throat> everything. It was a hard day. It wasn't worth the money. Two hundred quid. No, it wasn't worth the money. It wasn't worth the money. <laughs> it really wasn't worth it. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Bristol Festival. Oh, St. Paul's, I guess. Bristol Carnival. Yeah. Carnival. Bristol Carnival. Carnival. Yeah. Carnival. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good laugh down there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes. We used to go every week, now like, every year. So we'd, at the time, me and my, the gang I was in from Hackney, we'd all go to all the carnivals. Yeah. From when we was young, we used to go carnivals and try to rob people. We used to go oh. carnivals to rob people. We was troublemakers. <laughs> so we're like, all the mob of us would go to the train station and we'd go to carnivals and it was just a thing, you know, girls robbing people, whatever. We was Hackney mad boys. So that's what we used to do. We used to go carnival and represent where we used to come from, you know, and like, we used to do a lot of, um, a lot of fuckery, a lot of stupid, a lot of stupid stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it's all fun and games until a Mac 10's pulled on you. Yes, it is all fun and games until a Mac 10's pulled out on you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where um, I thought I was a goner because I'm, I was fat at the time when I was young, I was a lot fat, so I wasn't a good runner. So you pull out, I'm not the guy to run from bullets. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so I'll tell you the story. We went to Bristol Carnival, gone with a whole crew of us and there was beef at the time with our gang and other gangs. And we've turned up there and I didn't even know, we just went to enjoy myself. I wasn't going for no problems, just going to Bristol. I'm going to Bristol, we're just going to enjoy ourselves. We got the news that it was like loads of us, there's like a good few cars of us. So by the time we got to Bristol, I got the news that someone who was in another car had a gun on them. But, and we thought, okay, whatever. It was nothing new to have, having guns around in the crew. And so I was, but the person who had it, we was like, what's he got a gun for? Because he's not really that guy. You understand what I'm saying? He said, like, oh, whatever, what the hell? So we're there in the carnival and we're walking through about half an hour through the carnival and then we end up encountering a rival gang, basically. Right. So, and then they were, oh, they're over there and we're over here. And the guy with the gun ends up pulling it out in front of the rival gang to intimidate them. The most stupidest thing he could have ever done in the world. Now, I didn't know the gun was fake. <laughs> Shit. It was a fake gun. Yeah, it was a blank. blank. But nevertheless, you're not gonna muck with it. So no, that's why he was, we didn't know that at the time. Yeah. Like he, he was pulling it out, just kind of showing it to them. Yeah. The idiot. <laughs> the fucking idiot. What? Because he's put out, show it to them. The rival gang, <clears throat> someone in the rival gang who's got a real, <laughs> it's like the moment, this is real Desert Eagle 2.0, you know what I mean, in the movie. He pulls out a real <laughs> Mac 10. <laughs> and instantly, now he's not to know this gun's fake. He pulls out a real Mac 10. And they, I'm the last one that he's aiming it at me. <laughs> For fuck's sake. <laughs> right in front of me. He's basically aiming it at me. Everyone oh. else is run. He starts spraying this motherfucker. The oh, whole place no. is scattering. Holy shit. Yeah. He's right, he's, he starts spraying it randomly. How long ago was this? This is like 2000, year 2000, 2000. I'd say 99, 2000. Yeah. Yeah, 99, 2000, yeah. So like, he starts spraying this motherfucker and like everyone's, he's, I, I'll dive. Mm. I dive, cause I can't run. It's too late to run. Yeah. I thought it's hit up time. So I'd sort of, I don't know what I did. <laughs> I'm fat at the time. So I sort of done Drop some sort of fucking fat boy <laughs> dive. <laughs> And I remember hitting some barbed wire or something because I end up scrap my whole clothes got ripped, so my trousers got ripped. And if, and by the grace of God, I never got hit. I didn't get hit, and I don't actually know. I just ended up 
diving and I, I, I fell down. I saw it was like a hill or something and I fell down a hill and I run through that carnival for about two hours. Did anyone else get hit? Do you know? I don't know because I you left. No. I run. It was aiming at me. <laughs> well, don't, I don't know about anyone don't. else right now. I'm, I'm dying. Drop a roll. <laughs> yeah, literally. And like, it was crazy. So like, oh, um, man. It was, it's mad. So like, be careful who you're taking out fake guns on. You know what I mean? <laughs> Story. We were so pissed off with the guy because I thought it was such a stupid move to do. I was like, well, number one, why are you even like, we're there to enjoy ourselves. Yeah. There's no need for that. Fuckeries. Fuckeries. <laughs> what are you going to do with a fake gun? Nothing apart from get us all killed. <laughs> Which he nearly did. You know what yeah. I mean? So I've had mm. to dive over. I, I thought I was a gun, I swear. I was so, I remember I was so... um Shook up about it after getting shot. I was running through. I, I, I had this paranoia that the guy was chasing me for the car. <laughs> <laughs> I kept running. <laughs> I'm running. I keep running through. I'm, I'm running. I'm running. I'm running. I like for two hours. I keep. I'm running. I'm, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm at the other end of the carnival now, and I'm still paranoid. This geezer's running after me because I've just literally missed these shots, and and I've lost everyone now because there was loads of us. I don't even know where I parked or anything. <laughs> Ended up finding a friend. And I'll tell you the story. And then we ended up finding a friend and then we found the cars and then driving back and then stopped in the petrol station on the way back. And who do we see? The guy with the Mac-10. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> in the bloody petrol station. And he walks over to pay for his petrol and the Mac-10 drops out of his, pocket, out of his waist on, on the floor in the, in the court on the petrol station. I'm there in the car. I not fucking just drive. I get the fuck out of it. <laughs> and I'm like, I ain't, I'm not see shoot you. out in no petrol station. Now. He didn't see you. He saw all of us, I oh, think, because it was more than one car of us. He saw all of us, but it's in the petrol station. He was going to pay for his, he, he definitely, he was walking to pay for the bloody petrol with the gun on him. <laughs> it dropped out in the middle of the petrol. Exactly. On, on his walking from the car to, to pay for the petrol, the gun yeah. fell out. So he would have on the floor. I'm like, oh, for face, he still got it on him. Let's get the fuck <laughs> out of He didn't even leave that in the car. Yeah. So I was like, is this guy going to shoot us in the pit? Let's just get out of it. We'll get back to London. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Holy shit. Yeah. Bristol Adventures. Bristol Carnival. And most carnivals I used to go that time. Like, I remember even Notting Hill Carnival. Gunshots were a regular thing. Mm. A regular thing. A regular. I always used to come and spoil the event. Mm. Somewhere lit off shots and that's I remember it. them stopping St. Paul's yeah, one year because of it. Just spoils yeah. all the fun. Over exactly. two people war in, in, in the crowd or whatever, you know? So I'm used to yeah. that. But I'm not used to it being pointed at you. <laughs> 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 Do you think anyone is? But no. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, that was a close one. Papa War, yeah. Customs, Heathrow. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. What a story. <laughs> <laughs> right. So before I went to Jamaica, we was involved in smuggling. And um, hence the reason why I tried to bring over the six pound of weed myself because we was doing moves that was coming through and we had some forms that was good and some methods that wasn't. Anyway, friend of mine went to smuggle and they caught him in Jamaica first. And we actually paid f for his passport. So we got him out. Like, I was unlucky. We got, I, got a, I got a cop that you couldn't bribe he actually got a cop that you could bribe. And for 800 pounds, I got him released on road in Jamaica with his passport, ready to fly again. So, that, so they nicked him, and, but they didn't find all the weed. So let me give you the full story. It was 20 pound of weed he was smuggling. They found 15 pound, five pound of it was in trainers and shoes and slippers. So what, like, like in the soles? Or? Yes, yes. In the soles. Right. You've seen that method, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're professional. <laughs> yeah, ah, I, I, I see what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> that method was working for a long time. Apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> Expensive oh. shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in every shoe, you can fit four ounces. So in every sole, it actually fits four ounces. So we had like five pound worth of shoes, five pound of weed in weight of shoes. Yeah. Trainers, slippers, everything. And 15 pounds in t-shirts, hidden in t-shirts, brand new t-shirts sort of thing. I may add, that's Excuse nothing me. to do with my company. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was organic cotton. <laughs> <laughs> Links in the description box, folks. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, we had all of that. And he got, they found the T-shirts. 
So when he got nicked, he's actually in the JLAS wearing the slippers with the weed in it. Because he phones me up and says, oh, I want to open this. And I have a spiff. I said, no, you're not opening it. He told me bloody open it. Because <laughs> he was tempted to smoke a spiff when he was in the jail. So I'm going to get you out of there. I'm doing the best. So we actually got him out of there. We loaded him back up. <laughs> Sent him <laughs> Sorry. to Gatwick. So I said, oh, he can't get nicked. He was, he was going through Montego Bay at the time. So he was like, he got nicked in Montego Bay. We're sending him again. He says, oh, look, he can't get nicked again. Bloody hell. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So he makes it through Montego Bay. Bang, Gatwick. Now, my dad didn't want me to go and pick him up. Because he says, you're... Don't, it's, it's easy, better I go. So I wanted to go and pick him up, but he says, no, you let me go. It looks better. You, you know what I'm saying? It looks better. The, the older Greek man going to look him than me might look a bit dodgy in the airport. So he said, let me go and pick him up. I said, okay, cool. So dad's gone to, Papa was gone to Gatwick to pick him up. So he made, I got the phone call from Jamaica. Yeah, he made it, Cruz. He, he got, he made it through Montego Bay. So we've loaded him back up now. He's got another 15 pound of weed in the t-shirts and, and he's still got the five pound of weed in the trainers, which they didn't find from the first time. Didn't even find it. Mm. Comes to Gatwick. My dad's there waiting for him in the airport. The flight comes in. Everyone comes off the flight. I phone my dad. I says, he come out of the plane yet? Is he there? Is he there? He says, no. He's, my dad says, no, everyone's off the plane. He still ain't come out. I said, oh, don't tell me that. So he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting. He's in the airport and the tannoys, all of a sudden, it's like half hours, hour after the flight's landed. Everyone's come off the plane, no sign of him. Doesn't look good, right? On the tannoys, it says, Zorba, could you report to customs and excise? Zorba. Now that was my dad's nickname. Oh, right. And he used to call him Zorba. Zorba. The, yeah, Zorba. Zorba the Greek. <laughs> oh. You know, you heard of Zorba the Greek? No idea. It's Dave. a famous Greek, Greek dance. Because my dad's Greek Cypriot. Oh, You've okay. heard of Zorba the Greek. Yeah. 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 Right. So he, Zorba was his nickname. So he would call him Zorba. So on the tannoys in the airport, it says, Zorba, can you report to, can you please come to the customs and excise, whatever it is, desk. Mm -hmm. My dad heard it. And he went to the desk. Ooh. And he's gone to the desk and he said, and they said to him, oh, are you come to pick up Mr. Da, 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 da. And he says, yes. And he says, oh, I, he, I'm sorry, but he's been arrested for smuggling cannabis. Right. And he's been taken to this police station three miles away. If you want to go and pick him up, he'll be released out, but he'll have to go back to court. So they gave the details of police station. So my dad's just about to leave the desk. And they say, oh, by the way, would you like to, he's got cases here, suitcases. Would you like to sign for his suitcases? My dad says, yes, of course. My dad says, oh, what a stupid boy. What's he doing that for? He's telling to the customs, the bloody idiot. What's he trying to smuggle weed for? Bloody idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Great play. <laughs> right. Yeah. Could you, do you want to sign for his suitcase? Oh, God, I'll take the suitcases. So he signs for the suitcases, goes in the car park, phones me up, he says, Fido, that's my real name. <laughs> What's the we did? <laughs> so your real name said, is Theodore? My real name is Neophytos. Ne Neophytos. Oh, fantastic. Neophytos, yeah. Neophytos. This is a Greek name, yeah. Fido for short. I thought you said Theodore. Fido, Fidos. <laughs> so Fido is short for Neophytos. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, this is the Greek short abbreviation of it. So my dad would call me Fido. Yeah. So my dad was like, Fido, what's the we did? I said, well, it's in t-shirts and shoes. <laughs> so he's opened the case. He's in, he's in the car park of the airport. <laughs> right. He's opened the case. He's like, well, the t-shirts are gone, but the shoes are there. <laughs> <laughs> Would you believe the customs gave him back the case with the weed in it? Oh, oh man. Oh. Brilliant. Unbelievable. Wow. wow. <laughs> Five pound of weed. <laughs> Still, so that same one's in the shoes that he was running around in because they didn't find it in Jamaica either. Mm. They kept finding the t-shirts. <laughs> So it was 20 pound of weed altogether. It's 15 pound in the t-shirts. They bust yeah. the first 15 pound in Montego Bay. Then the second 15 pound, they bust it in Gatwick. But the shoes and the slippers and the five pound, <laughs> which was actually the better weed. Oh, good. It was the creme de la creme. <laughs> That's why it was separate. It was more expensive. Lovely. The ones in the pat in the shoes, it was a more expensive weed. It was the creme de la creme weed. It was actually the special weed. So the special weed ended up coming through. <laughs> That drives from the <laughs> airport to the police station yeah. with the weed in the car. Holy shit. Waits, <laughs> waits for him two hours outside the police station with the weed in the car. <laughs> 
brilliant. <laughs> drives and, and we're waiting in Stoke Newry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm back in Stoke Newry at the house waiting for him. And drives him back and comes out. He's yeah. He, he ended up going back to court and doing a little bird for it, of course. But um, come back to <laughs> Hackney <laughs> with the weed. <laughs> Enough got through to get him a lawyer. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And we all had a good smoke that night. <laughs> all was not lost. <laughs> so going to Jamaica at twenty-one. Yeah, about that. Yeah, lovely yeah. place. Yeah, beautiful. It was yeah. like my dream to go because I grew up around Jamaican culture all my life. Yeah, <clears throat> and even the patois. Yeah, talking that from before in Jamaica. Just being a, growing up around the commu community, such a hardcore Jamaican community around the culture. Yeah. My first girlfriend's Jamaican. Oh, I think I heard that in your last yes. interview, but yeah. Yeah, so it was like, so yeah. the whole Jamaican culture was very close to me, so I was very excited to go to see. Where was the first place you went when you went there? Spanish Town. Spanish Town. Yeah, actually Spanish Town, the area. Montego yeah. Bay, which... Yeah. I, I flew. You been to Monte, Montego Bay? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. It's Loved beautiful. It. Isn't it a beautiful country? Beautiful. I, one of I the felt most safe. Beautiful. Absolutely safe. Yeah, a, yeah. You know, I, I think the, the, always, I mean, yeah. the stories we say, and there's good and bad everywhere. Oh, of course, there's good and bad everywhere. Jamaica's a paradise. Yeah. yeah, but it's like, it's like everywhere. You get, you can get really good and really bad. The rumors that they hear that they talk about Jamaica, oh, don't go. It's not safe. It's not true. Bollocks. It's not true. It's <laughs> no, yeah, you got good, it, there is parts where you can't, of course. There is parts where, but you wouldn't go there as a tourist. Well, exactly. It's only crazy people like me don't go. There. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you go to I'm the like, nice no. beaches. <laughs> yeah, and, all inclusive. Yeah, <laughs> and leave me to run around <laughs> the shit off. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah. one of the viewers sent this question in. Yeah, there. yeah. It's, it's from Ray Sissom. Okay. For Tug of War. Yeah. Um, when did your accent change? Yeah. How long did it take to change? If it changed in Jamaica, yeah. it, doesn't it go back to English? Are you still in touch with Viz Cartel? I've vibes, seen, vibes Cartel. Vibes Cartel. Yeah. I've seen people calling you a Greek, pretending to be English, pretending to be Jamaican. Yeah. How do you respond to those people? Ooh. Well, I don't pretend to be anything but myself. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not, I never exactly. pretend to be anything <laughs> but myself. And like I said, um, I grew up around the Jamaican community. I grew up, um, my mum's best friend was Jamaican growing up. Yeah. I grew up around Jamaican people all my life. I've been speaking Patwa before I went to Jamaica. Like I said, my first girlfriend's Jamaican. I, grew up, I fell in love with reggae music from a very early age. Speaking patter from before I went to Jamaica, for being in the community I grew up in. Going to Jamaica sort of um, made the, I think, solidified the pat patwa more. Can you speak patwa to me? Yeah, I could. I could, but you see, that's the thing. It's, it's, like, it's a natural thing. I wouldn't really. Where yeah. are, where are you dealing? You cool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's Love a natural it. thing. It's like if, if I talk to I'm half Greek Cypriot. So yeah. if I speak to a Greek person, you'll hear a Greek accent come out of me. So you're quite a comedian. Yeah. yeah. I wanna say yeah, comedian. I'm very twangy twangy. Yeah. But I, it's because I'm half Greek, half Irish. I've if you put me in a room full of Greek people, you'll hear my Greek you accent. Come out. Do you, um, you put me in a room full of Irish, like, would you start chicken or um, my Irish accent? <laughs> My Irish accent is not that Jigging. great. My Irish accent is not that great. Can you demonstrate no. that, Jen? What's, what's jigging? And you know, my, my pa <laughs> What was it? She said, when you start jigging, Jig go jigging. to Ireland. Like a dance. <laughs> I can do anything after a couple of drinks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you want to see me go? I've got some special dances. Oh, wow. I've got the I invented the jig. <laughs> 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 I'm ready to jiggy. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Javelin. Huh? Javelin isn't that dance move. Javelin? No, that's a sport, isn't it? Javelin? No, it's apparently people. Oh, no, it isn't. No, it's someone jumping out of a car and having anal sex with someone, like jumping on. Oh, wow. That's... Yeah, I've heard that before. Oh, that, 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 that that's just, a thing. That just blew me away. I never heard <laughs> it. <laughs> ja right. Javelin. It happened to one of my friends. No name. Go on. Right. Um, a man jumped. A man's bent over and a man well, jumps out worse. of a van yeah. and lands on his bum with his penis and has sex. But it's like jumping out, out. of a van. Yeah, with a van. Out of a van. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is just an experience. It could be off, you know, the table here. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> is this like dogging, but. Another, I think so. Another kind I of level. There, but... Another kind of level. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> Look into it. <laughs> that sounds. 
<laughs> that sounds more mortifying than Spanish stamp. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, brilliant. What was the gay block called? <laughs> number oh. one block. Number one block. Number they might be doing block. that number one block, but they're I not like only fans. Oh, yeah, they, they're doing all sorts <laughs> they're doing of number one block. block. <laughs> <laughs> Like that sounds javelin. Ex- that's javelin. So, that's so javelin. extreme, though. Oh, I've learned a new word. It's... Javelin. Yeah, javelin. Javelin. I don't know whether it's in the Urban Dictionary or whatnot, but wow. yeah, apparently so. Wow. Okay. Mm, I teach a lot. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next one was. It's getting. It's going to get hardcore now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jail fights and killing. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> A lot of that. A lot of that. <laughs> a, lot of that. <laughs> a lot of that. A lot of that. Yeah. <sighs> Fights and killing in there. It's like, it's a mission to stay alive every day. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's a mission to keep your head above water and people just want to hurt each other because it's a, for the least, for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's all over nothing as well. When you think about it, it's actually over nothing and it's all just frustrated people. Mm. Shit ton of testosterone. It, and that, exactly. <laughs> Lots, a too lot. much testosterone. Yeah. testosterone in, in one in a box. Yeah, too yeah. much of it, and it overheats. It's too much. It's too much, and um, yeah, too much egos, too much people with silly pride. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. That that side of it's very dangerous, and you don't know who to trust. Yeah, you don't know who to trust because anyone could be your enemy. Someone be nice to you today, and tomorrow they want to kill you. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. You don't know who's very two faced people. You, no, no one, no one's. You can't trust no one. No, you can't take anything no, for gospel in there. Yeah, you know, a lot, a lot of fights. Like even the, min, the when I got locked up in the jail, like, is someone got killed? I think just a day before I got there. Right. And they had like a, they, they they marked his memorial on the wall, like a little red cross. Someone just got killed there yesterday. You understand what I'm saying? It's like it life. Must be a head like, fuck. Absolutely. Yeah, life, life it doesn't value much. No. In there, no. It doesn't value much, and like what, like what I said before, you get you get accepted as a piece of meat. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not gonna come out. It, you you come out as a piece of meat, maybe not a life piece of meat, but there's no value for life in there. No. And another death is just another death is just another death. It's just another that de- another day. Another day. Yeah. yeah. It's another day, so it's it's nothing's looked at like that. Then there's nothing to stop it either. The wardens don't stop it. It's you know the prisoners run the prison and the jailhouse. Well, more the prison. Yeah. But the prisoners are the ones who run it. You know, so it's not even the wardens that have no say in anything. They can't save. No one can't save you in there. Nobody can't save you. So it's like. So how you, do you cope? You got to make. You gotta watch your. You got like what I said before. You gotta use a lot of your ears and your eyes and use less of this. Try not to get yourself in problems. Try not. Don't talk too much in front of people. Don't mix with people who are troublemakers. If you see people who are yeah. idiots, you don't want to mix with them because you're just gonna end up in arguments with them and war and beef. You got everyone's in there doing time. Yeah, of course. You just want to do your time and get out. But you how know, do you get any sleep. It's hard. Yeah. Very hard. Very, very hard. It's very hard to sleep. You're sleeping with one eye open. That's the rule in there. Yeah, of course. The rule is sleeping with one eye open. Yeah. Literally. Literally. Sleeping. Is your door open then on your cell at night? Not in the prison, no. But you got cellmates. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I don't trust them. Exactly. That's the one eye open I, part, isn't it? I was, um, a couple of my cellmates were really cool. So I made some good friends in there as well. So I had one or two cellmates that I got on really well with. But like even in my cell, the guy in the hammock on top of me, he was in there for rape. Oh man. Um Yeah, exactly. And I think it was a I think it was a underage thing as well. I think it was some sort of you know, so I was just that's a really dark disturbed dark person. Yeah. And and he didn't talk to us. He wouldn't eat from us. He was just totally like he, he was in we weren't no conversation, like, like he wasn't even there. Right. This geezer's sleeping on top of you. Like you'd think he can come down in the night time and just cut your throat. He's he's mad. He's disturbed. Yeah. You understand? He, he don't talk to any of us. Like we'll be cooking food. He doesn't want to eat from us. He doesn't Proper want recluse. anything. Nothing. He just goes in his hammock. So I was, I'm in a cell yeah. with someone who I didn't talk to. I said two words to him for like six months. That drove me mad. Yeah. Honestly, that's one person. That's one person in my cell. How many people did you have in the cell total? Four, four, four. Three of us on the floor, one in the hammock. Yeah, yeah. It's like it can go up to five. Three on the it floor. It can go five, six. Yeah. No bunks. You have no. one on your own. 
I, by the end of it, I played the system, got one on my own. That's the oh, best, you, that's the you, best yeah, situation. Yeah, you, you play the system. You, can, yeah, you yeah, can't go wrong. Yeah, yeah. You can't go wrong. That's yeah. that's what people do in it to play the system. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, I, I was never going to get that because I'm on a short sentence. Mm. Yeah. So short sentences, we're never going to get our own. Just so. get your head down. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What, what I noticed was I was on this yard and they had building A, B, C, and D, mm. and I noticed when people left, the new arrivals got put in A first. Then in B, right. Then in C, like them, but them. But I, wa I wangled my way to a high D, right. So I was like, all the new rivals would just come in. They would never get to D. <laughs> so I'd be on cell for ages. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kids, so you had to on cell for ages. Yeah, for, okay, because so because if they make it down there, they'd be in there with you, basically. Because the computer just sent them to the first available cell, right, in alphabetical order, right. So A one. <laughs> Oh, okay. so A building filled first. Yeah. B, C, D. Yeah. They hardly ever came. Hardly ever came. So I managed to get a high D. Oh, wicked. So they hardly, yeah, yeah. That was wow. only, that was only for a shot. Most, mostly yeah. I had cellmates. Yeah. But it's like living in the. How top. many in your cell? In medium security, there was three. That was the most. Okay. Yeah. Okay. On three, nice lads. Three bunks. Three bunks. Yeah. <laughs> nice lads. Wow. I had, a, I had a, a Chicano, a Chicano gang member who was a rule eleven, so he was mentally ill. Yeah. He was rapping all the time, and he'd stay up at night singing raps. To he had like a grasshopper and a mosquito. Wow! But he took the legs and the wings off them. What? So they couldn't get away. Just, he just, so they couldn't. So they, they can't really yeah. So they were there with him all night long. Oh my god! And he, he got this little toilet roll. And, and rap. I mean, he would, he would like he would spank them. It's like the Salvadian family, and he's, and he's <laughs> rapping to them all night long. There's the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably the best one. And he was sneaking it? behind me and like catch me on the words and just grab my trousers and just yeah. <laughs> now that's it's so crazy because you see things like that. Yeah. yeah. It defines Joe. You know, that's what is it? People so much of that, isn't there? So much of that shit. Yeah. Weird, and 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 people it's constant, constant. Yeah. Because you know what? Yeah. <laughs> every every, every yeah. one of us is different. Yeah, of course. We are all different as individuals, human beings. And yeah. you know what? Everyone's brain is different, and you need to do things to keep you sane. Busy. Yeah. Busy. Mm. That is keeping him sane. <laughs> like to him, like it might seem ridiculous. We laughing like it now. It, so it sounds yeah. so ridiculous. Like he's rapping yeah. to two little insects. Yeah, yeah. Spanking but them. in his <laughs> spanking him, spanking him. Like it, bad. You see what? <laughs> That's he was. He was saying things there. You end up going dude, doing. <laughs> the, you end up going there. You know, like what we used to do was have banter with a make believe thing every night. Yeah. So yeah. We, when we lock down, we pretend that we're going out. Are we you in the club? Yeah, we're going to the club tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did a bit of that too. You do, you do that lying, like yeah, you lying, you talking shit. And we start dancing the song. We're yeah, at, we yeah, are yeah, at yeah, the yeah, club. Yeah. This is the club. I, this is the club. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what they say? You see, happiness is a mindset. It's not a place. So you'd like, like choose the food you wanted to eat in your mind. Everything. Yeah. The girls we like dated. The yeah, <laughs> everything. The cars we drove in today, the, the drink we've drank. Oh, we're stopped for oh. a steak. Oh no, we're, we're on the way. We'll meet you. We're going for a steak first. I'll meet you at the club. We're, we're having a steak first. Did you pretend to eat it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, we literally, like we'll be there, like, down. the vibes, we couldn't have the music on. We'll be there, like, we're in the club, where do you go, Asylum? So we're just making up of the club, of one club called Asylum in King. So yeah, we're in Asylum. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Our, our closest club was Freedom. <laughs> and there was a radio broadcast we picked up from Club Freedom. Wow, it's called yeah. Freedom. The club's called Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. Freedom. No. Freedom. I was taking the piss. Okay, no. But that's the dream. Yeah. 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 So that actually, you can actually fantasize now. We're going to have freedom tonight. Oh, you're not coming. You're coming tonight. You're coming to have freedom. And you know what? Yeah. You'd be in the worst mood in the world, but you'd be saying, yeah, we mean, man, I'm coming, man. I'll see you there. And it uplifts your spirit. Yeah, of course. It's to be your spirit, yeah. for the morale. Uplifts your spirit. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you just live mine. It would drive you crazy, but if you don't, you like, you just have it, that will be depressed. Yeah. In it, yeah, we were dancing in our pink boxer shorts with towels wrapped around our heads. Yeah. <laughs> just to, to just, be, to, just, to, be, just to build the vibe, crazy singing. Mm. I'm gonna lose my mind up in here, up in here. Wow, <laughs> you fucking did. Trust me. <laughs> do you know what? Do you know what going on a date in prison is? Oh, don't go on. So you get a picture of your missus and you go to shower and you've got it in like a plastic bag and you tape it to the wall. Another. Oh no! And you beat off. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, that's crazy. I'm going on a date tonight. Do you get dressed up? That's crazy. <laughs> Do you know what the thing is? 
<laughs> oh, I didn't beat her for six months. No. You can't do it in Spanish now. <sighs> How? Like, it's not comfortable. There's no privacy. There's no, there's not at one <sighs> point I'm going to have privacy to do that. Rumour I've heard is the shagging of the mattress. Is that true? The hole in the mattress? I never tried no. that one. But I don't get a mattress. Oh, well. Yeah, <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would have loved the mattress. We didn't get anything like that. We, we I, I had to buy a sponge. Like was, I was sleeping on newspaper to begin with. Of course. And then you buy a sponge, which is like a, like this. <clears throat> oh, this right, thick. foam. It's thick as that. A foam, a sheet of foam. Yeah. I buy a nice my bed. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't make a hole in it then. <laughs> it's not gonna work. It's, it's still gonna work. It's called a foam. And then I'm going for the concrete. <laughs> <laughs> In Arizona, after about three years, you go from your right hand to your left hand. And then when you get bored of your left, you go to the Fifi bag. Oh, right. fucking hell. Right. Like a sock or a flannel with lube and soap and, and stuff. Wow. Yeah, just try and replicate Romantic. them. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Pocket I mean, pussy. I, we, we had pictures of girls. <laughs> you know what? It's, that was that was crazy because you know what? That's the, that's, that's the most dreadful thing for me for being locked up because I love to be around. Females. I know we've not talked about that. No, it's, it, uh, it's the hardest part, it's hard, isn't it? Trust me. Really? Trust hardest me. part? No, 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 no. The hardest part. Let yeah. me see. Yo, that's the hardest part. That's the hardest part. And you know, another hard part as well. I need to, you know, I had my, I had my girlfriend phone me and, and tell me that she cheated on me while I'm in jail. Oh. Oh. That's quite hard to do with as well. Because you're locked up. Yes, that's, that's. You see, some people never recover from that. I seem, listen. Listen, that will mash up a man more than anything else mm -hmm. in prison. That's why people get murdered. Yeah. You wonder why he killed him? It's where the cure It's because of her. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't really have beef with him. <clears throat> he didn't really have beef with him. He made a wrong move. <laughs> he he didn't have funny. no beef with him. It's what she said to him last night. <laughs> He's got to take it out on someone now. Yep. And it just happened to be you. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? So like, that, 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 that's, that can mash, mash you up. You see guys looking at the car park mm. out through the cell window, you know, waiting for the missus car to come. It never comes. And every week they're just stirring. Yeah. And then the faces, they just yeah. go fucking depressed oh. and mental. Yeah, so women yeah, yeah. are the cause. See that? <laughs> all evil. All evil. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll take that. It's, it's mad because on our section, on the top floor, you can see the road. So um, the visiting situation <coughs> was crazy. Now, because my ex was living 10 minutes from the prison, I was getting a lot of visits. And, and like, which the prisoners couldn't figure out, how the hell is this guy getting so much visits? I mean, they live in Jamaica and they ain't got a visit yet. And I'm, I'm getting visits every day of the week. And they could see, and they, they used to see my girlfriend coming from the top. So they shouted, oh, she's coming. They see her, like I'd even get the, the shout when she's walking towards the prison. But the, the guards now, where you, where you visit, you get to see them once a week on a Friday, right. where you go in a booth and actually be able to talk to her. Can you touch? No. It's the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> really? <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Now, you know, like in the movies where you've got the booths and the phones and like, yeah, I yeah. don't know, is it similar in your prison? Did Depends phone? on your security level. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So like, they, but like we said, it's like a, it's a slim piece of plastic and there's three booths, right. only three booths yeah. available. And all the prisoners are queuing up outside and it's opposite the number one block. So you've got to walk past the bloody number one block to get there and you're queuing up outside and you get about two minutes maybe a one and a half minute, two minute. You don't even get five minutes with your visitor. What do you talk oh. about in those two minutes? You've got to shove it all in. No, well, really quick. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. And this, it's not even worth it. And you know, we'd all, we'd all like, I'd dress up because, oh, I'm getting a visit today. So you'd put on your clothes and you, you, you will smarten up and you'll look forward to the visit. And the first time I went there and she ended up leaving in tears. The, mm, the, the, thing. the, um, the, 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 the soldier, there's soldiers standing by the booths with their big rifles right. and they bang it on the table for when you start. So they say it's so intimidating for the for the visitor. Forget us, we're used to it. Yeah. But say your mum's coming to visit you or something like that. It's fucking horrible. So the, the soldier bangs on the table and goes, bang, start. And then he's half roughing up. You see them, they even, I've seen soldiers beat a, someone, a woman before and we nearly rioted in the prison because of it. And the big what, riot, visitor? Yeah. Someone who's uh, one girl who was visiting someone, she, you know, she got beat by the soldier with the gun. Right. Yeah. 
in the prison and we we and we we, we all were nearly writing over it my my ex left there in tears she got roughed up she didn't get beat but How she she got roughed people? up like she left she left the prison in tears. Not because she wasn't in tears because of me. She's in tears because of how they've treated her. Like they've literally They tr treated her like they treat like animal, like, come here, yeah. go start. Like it's, she's not the one in prison. I'm in prison. Mm -hmm. But they're treating the people like dog shit. So, like, so that's the only way to describe it. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And then you can't, and then you pick up the phone to talk to them. Out of these three booths. There's only one phone that works. So if you get that booth, so my first time, listen, this is my first visit. I'm there, I'm on the phone, I'm like. <laughs> on I'm like, I'm saying, yo, this telephone ain't working. Say, hey, tough luck. Shit. So I knew for the second visit what booth to go, because I knew what telephone was working. There's only three booths. And only one works. And only one works. <laughs> What's the fucking point? <laughs> You there, like it's ridiculous, and you end up when the phone's not working because it's like a thin piece of plastic between you, so you can kind of shout and hear each other. So you end up shouting to hear each other, and then the soldier comes and bangs his gun again, and then he gun butts her off. <laughs> it's ridiculous. That's insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so insane. It's like, is this worth it? Like for two minutes, she <laughs> two left minutes. in tears. Another, not, another guy's getting one, and he got beaten up. We was gonna riot over it in the prison. And how long are they waiting for that visit? Like. Ridiculous. Some people, hours. Hours. For two minutes. Hours. Really? For two minutes. But no, it's not even the hours of the day. Some people wait in weeks and weeks. Some people might have a um, someone from another country flying to see them. Yeah. For two minutes. For two minutes of that. That's mental. Do you understand what I'm saying? It depends, some people's situation is different. Some, someone might have a relative who lives far in the countryside and has to really take loads of buses or something yeah. to come and visit them, an elder, elderly person yeah. or something like that. It's, it's horrible. It's horrible, you know what I mean? It's, it's okay, at the time my ex only lived across the road, so it's not too bad. She just walks from there to there, but the abuse is unreal. Yes. It's unreal. What unreal. about mail call? Did you get a mail call where you were at? Letters? Yeah. I did actually, yeah. I remember, yeah, I did get a letter. I remember them coming on the section and calling my name and giving me a letter, yeah. Yeah. So how does it work, mail call in Jamaica prison? And does the guard like announce over a thing or does he- No, come, there's no tannoys. <laughs> A megaphone. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Luckily, my cell, when you walk on my section, my cell is the third cell on the right. Right. I'm the third cell on the right. So as you walk in, so what they, I feel sorry for the people on the top floor because they don't hear them. Because what the warder will just come on the bottom and just say the guy's name. So me, he'll just come and say, Nelfito, Nelfito. And if I'm at the toilet, that's it. And, and if another prisoner doesn't take it for me, because another oh, he ain't here, I'll take it for him. Because I might have someone in my cell who say, oh, Oh, he's over there. I'll take him when I come back. So I'll oh, let her come for you. Yeah. And if someone don't do that, you're just not getting it. And it will just... And you get your letters right away when they arrive or do they sit on no, them for ages? No, no way. It takes weeks. You're lucky to get one. Like getting one was like, oh, I actually got something. <laughs> I got a letter. Like it's wicked. I'll be looking at the paper like, it's come for me. <laughs> like, you know what they made it? Someone knows I'm in here. Oh, really? I'm remembered. <laughs> like, you know what they made it? Like, it means a lot. Cause yeah. It's, it, it's hard to get something like that. I think it's every six weeks. What, what about books? Can people send you books? Yes, I think you can have books. Yes, you can send books in. Yeah, you can. Did the prisoners yeah. abroad send you anything in? I didn't get nothing from abroad. Mm. No. You can get stuff sent in, but I think books would have to more get... Um, I don't think you could post them in. You could have to visit the person with them. So prisoners abroad never helped you, that charity that helps people from the UK and no, no I never even heard of them <laughs> I think didn't Stephen Graham said they helped him I think they might have helped him I can't remember really we've had a few guests on right yeah Prisoners yeah. Abroad Prisoners Abroad is a charity out of London right and God bless and please support these people they do I think I work. heard of them actually if you're a UK citizen right in a foreign prison yeah they like assign you a caseworker and they like send you like newspapers from the UK and oh, books wow. and stuff. Yeah. And in some countries where you have to pay for your medical or you die, they pay for your, they medical. Pay for your medical. So they save people's lives. So yeah. is that nothing to do with the embassy? No, separate <coughs> from the embassy. Separate from the embassy. Did the embassy uh, visit you or anything? Remember, I was I avoided them. Oh, that's really? right. I kept yeah. avoiding yeah. them like yeah, an yeah. idiot. Yeah, that's right. And, and it, I, had yeah. To, I ended up seeing them because I had to. But <laughs> I, I had a bad time at the embassy. Yeah, because you were staying in the country, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I stayed in the country. Did yeah. you see what we did with Stephen Graham? The, the, uh, I saw a bit of it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah, I did. I did. What did you think about his experience? Oh, it's crazy. 
It's yeah. crazy, but not surprising because I know the I know the I know the um, conditions of the places he was. Yeah, it's like, like what, what Jamaica is a very nice place, but the prison it needs to be looked into. It needs to be looked into. It's very wrong how people are getting treated. Yeah, there. very very wrong. I've seen so many people like him and other people who who's had a really hard time. Yeah. A, bit too much of a hard hard time than, than they deserved yeah you understand what i'm saying and no one deserves to get treated like that no yeah, I'm not gonna look behind bars process, so. you understand what i'm saying for people watching them the stephen graham podcast i'll put the link in the description box but he was in the jamaican prison at the same time as tug of war but yeah in, in he a was different there at section. the same time yeah he was in a different section yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah. crazy because I, I saw it and i thought that's amazing yeah it's amazing that he yeah it's crazy and, we all... and he ended up being on my section as well yeah yeah did you cross paths you know what the thing is i looked at his face he looks familiar but i don't actually remember to be mm. honest with you i can't say i do if you met him i can't I, yeah. but you know everything's like you meet so many people yes you meet so many faces like i see so many people who had similar experiences to steven mm. you understand what i'm saying yeah. Every, yeah and you know everyone's experience is different as well of course. everyone's so if, so if you are watching and you like these jamaican prison stories <laughs> we've, we've, we also interviewed ashley nugent out of liverpool who he was a young person when he went in the young person's prison which is a whole different thing as well so I'll put all those links in the description box. Yeah, I mean, so you, you were talking about the corruption of the police and, yeah. and the guards and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Have you got any stories censoring around this corruption of the, of the police? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the prison or out? I got both. Both? <laughs> Should we start with before the prison? <laughs> before, I, well, I'll, I'll give you the in the prison. I, the same soldiers that would come and intimidate the visitors. I, I paid off everyone in the prison to get me stuff in. So I've even had a soldier deliver me weed to my cell. Wow. wow. Yeah, I've even had soldiers deliver me weed right direct to my cell. Like, there's, there's money talks. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Money talks. Like I've had everything brought in that prison. Yeah. Everything. I've had anything and anything brought in that prison. Yeah. And you can get anything in that prison as well. You just pay off the right person. Yeah, I remember course. when I got some weed taken, sent in one day. I didn't know how it was getting delivered to me because my phone i couldn't use it because there was a lot of waters on the section so i wasn't able to use my phone yeah and um i knew the weed was coming in that day but i don't know how it's coming so i'm standing at my cell i had to put the phone down because i would have got caught on the phone if i kept talking so i didn't get the information of how the weed's coming in i just know it's coming today i'm standing by the cell i'm sort of panicking i'm thinking oh bloody i've got weed coming in today i don't know how it's coming in i didn't manage to get the call and then while i'm at the at the door a soldier comes on top of the section and says, Nel Fetus, Nel Fetus! In his big green suit, soldier. No, no word, a soldier. Right. And I'm like, yeah. And he comes, is that you? And he comes up to me, he looks me up and down. He's got a little bag in his hand of salt powder. <laughs> <laughs> what we used to wash your clothes with, which you get yeah. a lot of that visiting in there. We call it soap suddy. Yeah. So the bag of salt powder. So he give me this bag of salt powder. I'm baffled. I'm like, I took it off of him. He says, that's for you. And they just walked away. I, I, I'm like, I'm there. I'm holding the salt. I'm at, I'm at my cell door like that. He just walked away. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? I feel this salt as I feel it, but I feel. <laughs> I the good thing I was by myself as well. Like my cellmates weren't there. I was like, okay, yeah, this is it. So I just got back. I feel the lump of weed in the salt powder. I've gone back in the fucking cell, <laughs> and and so it, the, that everyone knew it was fucking salt powder weed because that night I gave a few people a spiff. I said, "Tuck, you got this in salt powder, didn't you?" I said, "Yeah, do you know, I can taste it." <laughs> 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 yeah, literally, <laughs> literally. That is so corrupt over there. You could pay off police and warders to get you anything in. Them. So this ties into a question from one of the viewers. Yeah, Mady wants to know what the best strain was you got a hold of in prison. I got some crazy strains. In prison. <laughs> Listen, I'm a weed madman. I'm a weed madman. I went, I went in prison for this shit. <laughs> And Holy you know what? <laughs> the prison weed is not good enough for me. I'm, I, I have to, I, hunt, I, I need a high THC content. I need strong weed, me. I need some real good weed. And the regular prison weed is just bush. It's rubbish. Yeah. It's like smoking cigarette. It don't do you nothing. <laughs> Even from the jailhouse, I got weed smuggled in from jail before I went prison. Right. I got a quarter pound of weed put over the wall in jail. 
in the jail. And the jailhouse is crazy because our section was right next to the police. And I got this quarter pound of high grade. Yeah. I'm talking about indica, some really strong indica thrown over the wall in jail. Now, they don't mind you smoking weed. I'll give you a story about the weed in the jail and the prison. They don't mind you smoking weed. Like, as I said, I smoke weed in front of the prisoners and uh, the warders, the police. It's only a few warders you can't smoke in front of and a couple top you wouldn't smoke in front of. Yeah. But I got this weed, it was so strong. I stunk out the whole station. <laughs> the policeman, this is while I'm in the jail. The policeman come over and say, yo, you got, you can't smoke that one. He says, you can't, he says, you're taking the piss now. <laughs> like, honestly, like, I, cause I got this weed thrown over, it was the strongest shit and it stunk out the whole police station. <laughs> and it, down to the police was like, we don't mind you smoking weed, but that shit's taking <laughs> Honestly, it was like, no, nah, you can't smoke that one. It stinks. When the guys come, they're so stinking out there by the office. Like where they are with the decks, it's just stinking. You know what I mean? So yeah, I used to get high grade weed sent in for me because the weed they got in the prison wasn't cutting it for me. No. No, and then when that run out, I'd, I'd be searching around the whole prison. I'd go around the whole fucking prison <laughs> to find who's got the best weed. Yeah. yeah. I'd find, I'd say, who's got, because like, my section would have dead weed. Mm on my section, like no one in my section would have good weed. So I was like, okay, who's got over ship, grass. Do you give it away or sell it in there? Huh? Do you give it away when you get the good weed and the other sort of inmates want it? Do you give it away or sell it? I, I was selling weed from the yeah. first day in prison. Okay. So my first day in prison, I went to go and buy, I bought four ounces of weed to sell for my first day. Wow. Yeah, because I had cash on me and I know I'm just gonna buy, 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 no. So I went and bought four ounces from a guy called Mackerel on the second floor. Um, <laughs> And it was all wrapped up already. So I got all the wraps already. It was like 50 wraps wow. already. And I bought it for like 1,500 Jamaican dollars or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was. And then I bought Rizla and I bought cigarettes. So from my first day in prison, I was selling weed, mm -hmm. cigarette, Rizla, and then eventually phone cards. Oh, get in. Yeah, from the first day. And then it <laughs> did, the weed selling didn't last long though, because I was smoking too much of it. I ended up smoking it all. I didn't yeah. I didn't sell that much of it. I ended yeah. up just smoking it all, to be honest, because I'm in prison, I'm stressed. I'm just smoking spliff after fucking spliff. And I like what I said, I did smoke more weed than I got nicked for in there, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I did, yeah. But it's like um, a lot of people, you, you got you to gotta know what you're doing, because I'm... You gotta know what you're doing in there. Because uh, uh, most of the foreigners get extorted. Okay. So most of the foreigners get extorted. They they can't really buy stuff like that. They'll get money taken taken off of them or they gotta let someone look after the money for them or yeah. something like that, you know? But that wasn't the case with me. Yeah. So this is the story of as asked, did Tug of War meet any English female prisoners? in the Jamaican jail called either Justine or Tammy. One was tall with dark hair, the other was a fit blonde. Both <laughs> caught smuggling at different times who were friends of mine. Wow, what's their names? Tammy, fit blonde, and Justine, dark hair. I can't say I know by the names. Yeah. I All the men and the women aren't together, are they? Are they? No, no. So you wouldn't even see, mix my... what you with the females unless you were at court or something? The only, uh, because my ex was ended up going for Augustus. Yeah. So my ex was in the female prison. Yeah. So, and the dentist is on my section. So when the females need to go to the dentist, they all come to Spanish Town Prison. Wow. So I've seen them come at once. My ex actually, I've seen my ex come to Spanish Town to come. <laughs> I'm dead. I'm waving. You're right. <laughs> see me out. <laughs> like you see them from the distance and they yeah. come to see the doctor or the dentist in Spanish Town Prison. And that's as close as we get. And there's a, there's a couple jails where the men and the women are close together, but never mixed. Does anything ever happen that you're aware of? Um, no, not that I'm aware of, to be honest with you. No. Got it. No, I'd say so as well. I'd say so yeah. as well. I'd say so as well, but not not in Spanish town. No? Nah. Uh. Nah, <laughs> unfortunately. Wayne Sargent wants to know what was one of your worst days in prison? My worst days? Yeah. Wow. You're having a particularly yeah. bad day. Um, after my ex got sentenced, I was going back and forth to court 
Yeah. So, which was nice. I got a day out of the prison. Every time I go to court, I was really like, towards the prison, ah, oh, I'm going out. Here we go. I'm going on the town. And that's really yeah. like, because we used to pretend to go to the club. So I'd come back you... to the prison. Remember, we used to pretend to go to the club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd come back to the prison. I just went to the club. <laughs> I just drove past the club. I was looking at all the girls on the road. I drove downtown. I'd come in the club, they're bossy. I just, I'm like, I got, I got escorted by police because one time I missed the prison truck from the court because they had me. Going back to court four times and I didn't even see the judge yet. Yeah. It just got me sitting in the bloody bull. I just made sure I had enough weed. And was there. <laughs> one time I missed the prison truck, I got escorted by a police car from Kingston all the way back to Spanish Town. Nice drive out. Come back and say, oh, I've been on the drive, me. <laughs> what are you doing? You know what I mean? But yeah, one of my worst days in the prison would have been when my ex got sentenced and my visits kind of stopped. Mm. And I find... Then I, um, cause I was living good at the f my first half of my sentence. I was living good in the sense of I had loads of food coming in. Yeah, you know, I'd I had money. Money situation was good. I was okay. And then when my ex got sentenced, my my visit slowed. I wasn't getting visits no more. Food wasn't coming in no more. And then uh, I'd go. I remember going like four or five days without eating. And I remember her sister having to come into because I didn't eat prison food. And we'd cook the food in our cell because the prison food would run your belly mm. and you can't shit in your cell. <laughs> so the prison suits are no, no. The only thing I would eat from the prison was a bit of steamed callaloo, which was grown in the prison. Which you was can't safe. poo in your cell. Remember the piss pots in this part one? Yeah, you can't stuff. shit oh, in your cell. Shit. Yeah. yeah, you can't shit in your cell. So you have to program your body to go toilet at a certain time you of the day. Have you ever had an accident? No. Oh, thank God. No, <laughs> thank God. Yeah. yeah, and I've seen like, there, I've seen in people, I've had, a, I've seen people have accidents yeah and it's 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 a horrible it's a horrible uh, thing you've actually got a, they've, they've all got to lift up their mattresses he's got to go in the corner and do his business and he wraps it up in a bag and has to put it outside the front of the cell if you put that bit too close to the person in the other cell that's another fight in the morning mm -hmm. it's just designed for problems well, exactly so yeah, yeah if you got a yeah whatever you do don't shit yourself yeah <laughs> just hold it so I'm you gotta to program your body to eat food that's not gonna run your belly. Yeah. Don't drink milk. Don't drink this. Like don't drink anything that's gonna eat anything that's gonna upset your stomach and make you want to go toilet because you can't afford to go toilet. So I ended up living off of callaloo and rice. Mm, I would. Or callaloo and bread. My I, I was shitting green for six months. <laughs> like baby <Literally>. poo. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember faint and early fainting. I remember going for my visit come and she brought me a little food. And I remember going and walking back with the I nearly fainted in the sun because I'd be like four or five days without food. And it was more, not because I, I couldn't, like, you know, because of my, my release date situation. I didn't know my release date. I was going through a big depression period in the prison where I was really pissed off. And I, I wasn't eating, I was smoking. And I kind of I was really run down, depressed. I was probably my lowest time in the prison. And my dad, where my dad was getting run up on, so I'm getting my dad, my dad was having a really hard time in England. So it was really depressing for me because I'm getting news from England that his life's in danger because they keep trying to rob him with guns and run upon him and all of that. So I'm getting all of that news while I'm in prison. Then I don't know my fucking release date. I haven't seen the embassy. I'm running around, trying to stay alive every day. It just it was really depressing. So I buy that. And that was towards the end of the sentence. And I got so used to the place. You know, the day of my release, I didn't even rush to walk out. It's like I didn't want to go. Yeah. <laughs> it was mad because it's like the whole journey outside the prison was a whole nother mission for me. That my my release was a whole nother journey in Jamaica, where it was a whole nother dangerous grounds I stepped into in Jamaica. Mm. My doing the music and running around Kingston and stuff like that. But yeah, um, some low points in the prison. Yeah. So, yeah. Go, so just a few questions coming on the music then. Yeah. So this is from Masagana. Mm. For Tuggy, yeah. I ask this as a massive fan of reggae dancehall <laughs> and yeah. being white. Yeah. But how did you find it being a white guy in a genre of music like that? And does you feel fully accepted by that community, especially in Jamaica? I've personally never encountered any issues in abashment, etc. Mm. But maybe it's different for an actual artist, much like how minority artists in this country are blackballed by record labels, etc. Mm -hmm. I've never felt like that. Jamaica um, is a special place for music. Mm. And they really appreciate talent over there. And no matter what, and not even just Jamaica music, they appreciate every type of music over there. Yeah. If you've got a talent for music over there, they really appreciate you. And 
and they uplift you. My career started over there because of the support I got from J Jamaican people and Jamaicans. That's what lifted me up. Yeah. You know, um, you always, you're always gonna, no matter, I'm, I'm an outcast, I'm a white guy doing reggae music. So it's always gonna be that aspect of it. But what, what did he say? Did I feel what, sorry? Did you feel like how minority artists in this country are blackballed by record labels? Did you feel fully accepted by that community, especially Yeah, in fully accepted, yeah. 100%. I, made, I got made feel like one of them in Jamaica. I am accepted. That was the beauty of it. And I was very, I didn't want to leave Jamaica. Like the whole industry accepted me from the prison onwards, to be honest with you, in, when it comes to the music. Like my career started in the music in the prison and like they accepted me from the prison and from the road and everything because they could see how good I am and how pure I was at it. You know, and that was just, I, I uplifted me, really accepted me. That was what was so powerful about your story, how you ended it last time. Mm -hmm. Mashup Central wants to know your favorite current dancehall artists. Have you heard of or checked out Intense or Iwata? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Intense is pretty cool. Yeah, he's a new, new act. I like a new artist called Skilly Beng. He's quite good. I like his voice. He's got a um, good style. I like Popcorn. He's one of my favorite artists, dancehall artists. Um, Mavado has always been, a f I've been a fan of Mavado, but I, modern artists nowadays, maybe Alkaline, people like that. I'm, I listen to so much of myself. I'm the biggest, my biggest, I'm the biggest fan of Tug of War. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite artist is Tug of War. Well, the next question from Sound Vision is, who is Tug of War's biggest musical influence? My biggest musical influence? Yeah. I've got a few. Yeah. I've got a few. So it would be Supercat, Biggie Smalls, Ninja Man. Um, Bounty Killer, Beanie Man. Well, I've got a lot of hip hop influence, so like people like Supercat, um, Biggie Smalls, Wu Tang Clang. I grew up on that that era, you know. So it's a mixture of hip hop artists and reggae artists. And Papa San, like I, I grew up on some old school artists like Papa San and um, General Trees. Um, over here, veteran UK artist Smiley Culture. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Smiley Culture? He's actually a good friend of mine as well. Before he died, R.I.P. Smiley. Um, Saxon Sound from England. Saxon and Cox and I grew up on right. English reggae. That's what yeah. inspired me to be an English reggae artist is when I heard the English reggae artists. Yeah. Like Smiley, because they did it with the English accent. So like even my pato, I speak English. I'm yes, not Jamaican. So obviously yeah. we speak the pato, but even the English artists, we got a different twang to it. So we don't sound like that. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? That's what that's so that's what um attracted me to dance or music in the first place. The English reggae artists, like from Saxon sound. People like Smiley Culture, Papa Levi, some of these veteran artists from the 80s. I was big fans of them. So Hillbilly Amy in Alabama, mm. she's probably just finished her Vittles and Grits. Oh, I don't know. You got Hillbilly Amy. <laughs> yeah. She said, yeah. um, <coughs> she's been looking at the food that you put on Instagram, yeah. which is to die for. Yeah. And she's, won she's, yeah, wondering yeah, yeah. If, she's wondering if Mama War will adopt her. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna have to ask mum that one. My mum's an amazing cook. Oh right, okay. yeah, amazing, amazing cook. I'm really spoiled. I'm really lucky to have a mum who cooks such lovely food for me, and she cooks every day. It's really healthy. A lot of it is uh, vegan and vegetarian, right. so I don't eat a lot of meat after and prison. After, um, not after prison. Since the last, after my father died. Yeah. After my father died, I went into. I started comfort eating a lot after my father died, and I okay. put a lot of weight on. I went, I went into a bit of depression yeah, of course. and started comfort eating. And then I decided to turn my life around totally. Yeah. And that's when I started losing the weight. I dedicated myself, even though like I work out five, six days a week, I eat healthy. And I've um, when I do something, I do it to the fullest. And I've been like that for the last 10, 12 years now. Okay. Yeah. Well done. Bibby wants to know what was, what was the situation? <laughs> Bibby. <laughs> Sorry, I'll leave you here, <laughs> <laughs> what situation made you most fear for your life? Oh. What situation made me most fear for my life? I've had so bloody many. <laughs> you know what? 
When I left Spanish, what, in prison or overall? Throughout your entire life? Yeah, general. Oh, wow. I've had too <laughs> many. I lost sense of fear when I come out of prison. Mm. My fear my fear levels really disappeared when I come out of prison. Compared. Yeah, it was like, there wasn't much, like, that's why when I come out of prison and what I did in Jamaica after prison was phenomenal because I lost all sense of fear. So a lot of the stuff I did, I wouldn't have dreamed of doing before prison. I wouldn't have dreamed of doing it before prison. But being in the pr like prisons really bad in Jamaica, that's like the worst of Jamaica. Prison in Jamaica is, is the worst of Jamaica. So when I come out of prison, is, there was nothing in Jamaica to scare me or anywhere in the world. The world seems a safe place, doesn't it? Once you come out. Once I come out, yeah, like yeah it's like, oh, this is, I'm not in there. Oh, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, care. Yeah. Like, the only what, like, <laughs> Only thing I'm I don't like over there is the Jamaican police. I'm scared of them motherfuckers. The police yeah. over there are horrible. You know, but like sense of fear, in sense of fear, my fear levels really disappeared in Jamaica because your back gets put against the wall so many times and over my life as well. What is fear? Yeah. Um my I think fear my fear ended up consuming itself. My fear ended up consuming itself. Like it just disappeared because it just consumed itself. Where's the fear? It just disappeared. There's no more left. There's nothing left, there's no more fear left. You're gonna like obviously everyone's got a certain level of fear, but my fear kind of disappeared because of all the things I've been through. Yeah, especially after prison. Yeah, if you adapt to a dangerous environment like that, it just becomes routine, doesn't it? it this is it. Yeah, it's just another. This is how it began to feel. And you know, I've been growing up in a dangerous environment from before prison. So, as you can hear some of my stories, I've been so I've been so accustomed to to these things. That's why I think. I dealt with prison pretty okay because I was accustomed to certain levels of, of badness and stuff before even getting there. So it's like, it's like bring anything, you're already for it kind of thing. So Fifi Lamour. Fifi Lamour. <laughs> like that one, don't you? <laughs> What's Fifi Lamour like saying? star name <laughs> Sounds like, get <laughs> it? Fifi Lamour. Sorry. It's like a porn <laughs> Nice. Oh man! <laughs> can can Tugger yeah. tell us a story, yeah. one that you've not told before on the, this podcast about Papa War? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Tell you a story about Papa War. Everyone wants to hear some Papa War stories. What's it? Where's, where's my Where's my notes? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I had to make notes last night, man. I made so many, so many things that sometimes I don't like to forget things. And I was thinking about it. I knew they was going to ask me some things about Papa Wall. I told you the Heathrow story. Yeah, we got the Heathrow. <laughs> we got the Heathrow story. Okay, I'll tell you which one we didn't tell you. I'll tell you which one didn't I tell you? That's a hell of a Oh, list. yeah. <laughs> I could tell you the time when, well, my dad, oh, yeah, tell you the time when my father disarming about four people in England. He ended up collect doing, making his own collection of guns and clips. <laughs> he used to put them all on the mantelpiece and on top of the television. Yeah, I used to hide the guns in the drain outside the house, but he'd actually take the clips out and the bullets and put them on top of the TV for souvenirs. Right. To say, this person tried to rob me, but I got his bullets. <laughs> <laughs> this one tried to rob me, he got the bullets. I'll tell you how I found out about it, because I'm in prison at the time. And I didn't know he was doing such a thing, but when I got back, I saw the charge sheet and on his charge sheet, it's like weed, money, scales, this, that. And at the bottom, it says bullets. <laughs> and I'm like, dad, what the fuck? What's the bullets on the charge sheet for? What's going on? He says, oh, it's the ones when they come to rob me, I took their guns. <laughs> I said, yeah, but well, what did you do with the fucking guy? He said, put the guns in the drain, but he put all the bullets on top of the thing. <laughs> and the police took it. And they charged him for it, <laughs> but he, he did, they didn't charge him. He, said he, he, he had to explain to the police why the bullets are there now. <laughs> and he had them all lined up on top of the TV. <laughs> he said they were souvenirs. Man. I swear to God, I swear to God. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> like he was so, like he, was, he disarmed a lot of people because we had a gate. So he'd have people come in to rob him. I remember one time I was told, um, they came to rob him and they stick the gun through the gate, but he stick the gun a little bit far through the, through yeah. the gate and he just gone, Dah. How many times did people come and rob him? Oh, loads. 
Loads. Loads. Five, six, seven times. Shit. Yeah. And not one successful robbery. <laughs> <laughs> they give up after a while. <laughs> yeah. They give up after a while. This is mantle piece of and bullets. An, an, <laughs> another one. Go, did you have something for me? No, keep going. Yeah. Another one was a crazy one when um was it when I come back? I come back from I feel I come back from Jamaica and I, I was thrown into the deep end with the hustle and he got released from prison. And one of my plugs, my suppliers, he ended up to forming a big coke habit. And he was a good friend of mine. And we used to do a lot of business together. I'd do like 30, 40,000 pounds business a week with this guy. No problems for years, long time. And we was good friends as well. We'd go partying and partying together. And then I see when he, he started getting a bit under pressure with money and I owed him 7,000 pounds and he started changing up on me and he started turning up at my door early in the morning for like this seven grand. And I was like, Seven grand to me is nothing at the time because we're doing a lot more business than that. Like I'd give him 30 grand in a week. So I'm thinking this seven grand is nothing for you to be moaning about. But he kept turning up for this seven grand. I remember one morning he turned up for this seven grand. He's like, I'm not a morning person. And he turned up nine o'clock in the morning for this seven grand. And, I was, and, and my mum and dad actually let him in. And I would come downstairs to have a cup of tea. And he's sitting downstairs on my kitchen table having a cup of tea. And, I'm, and I know why he's there. I'm like, motherfucker, I just got a pat of bed. What the fuck are you doing here? And he's being, because he's my mate as well. He's like, oh, I'm his, and I can see. And I'm like, bro, like, no, I'm not going today. And he's, he's telling me he's under pressure. And he, I can see you just fucked up and you just fucked up your money and you've done a cold caveat and I ain't got the money today. And you weren't really taking, it was some weed that went missing. Someone, I ended up getting 30 pound of weed off of him. Four pound of it was no good. The guy who I held the weed, he ended up nicking the four pound of weed. So it was seven grand outstanding to pay off this little, little debt. So I ended up having to sort it out. So we're all having this little meeting in the kitchen over about this seven grand. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is just ridiculous. I had to call the guy that stole the weed to come down. He offered him 50 pound a week. He was like, it's not good enough. I was like, look, just chill yourself. It's not a problem. We'll sort it out. It's just not going to happen today. And he's like, do you understand what I'm saying? And he's like, he's not taking no for an answer. Not, not literally, but he's still hanging around. And I'm like, get the fuck out of the house. Let me carry on my day. I took to you tomorrow, next week, whatever. Not today. He's there at one o'clock, two o'clock. Some friends have come around now and now he's still in the kitchen. And I'm like, it's uncomfortable you being here now, bro. Like, it's like you're wait Because my house was a dealing house at the time. He's there trying to wait to see what money's coming in today, obviously. <laughs> he's standing now. He's hanging around. He's that desperate. He's hanging around now because he knows I turn over at this house. So he's hanging around to see what's going on. I'm like, no, not today. But he ain't really hearing me. Anyway, I don't get a little bit pissed off. I said, bro, come upstairs. I don't have a word of you. So my dad sort of sees me get a bit fed up of him and take him upstairs yeah. to the living room. And I sat him down and I says, bro, look, all good, but today is a no-no. Like, let me sort something out. I'll give you a ring tomorrow. Re -te -te. Right, today is not a good day. Like, it's, it's not a good day. Full stop. He ends up banging his hand on my marble table, at the marble table in the living room. And he goes, I need it today! Bang! And I'm like, I jumped and I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm with to strangle him. So I'm strangling him now on top of my sofa. I'm with my knee in his thing and I'm, I'm I've had it up to here now. He's pissed me off. It's too many hours. He's pushing too far. We're friends, but this is ridiculous. I'm gonna kill you now. <laughs> <laughs> my dad knows I lost it on him and it was a bit too much. It was a bit mm. too much. The way he banged, he was disrespectful. I wasn't expecting it from him. He didn't know me that well to do that. Even though we're friends, we're not that good of friends, and no one's banging on my fucking table. Like I'm, while I'm, my dad thinks I'm going to kill him. So because he thinks I'm going to kill him, he goes for the machete. So he comes in with a big sword to kill him. And we're arguing who's going to kill him. <laughs> oh, family life. That was me. <laughs> because he don't want me to, he's like, I go to prison now, I don't care, I kill him. <laughs> and he's got the knife in his hand and he's yeah. like we're, we're having a barney about who's going to kill him <laughs> in the living room I'm, I've got my foot on his neck I'm strangling I'm, like, I've got my foot on his throat I'm, I'm fed up of him <laughs> I'm showing like a, I don't want to kill him but he's, he's forced he's pissed me off this guy so my dad said no you ain't killing him I'm killing him Right. so he's coming with the sword to kill him 
<laughs> now, remember, I've got mates downstairs in the kitchen. <laughs> they hear all the rumblings upstairs. They've all run upstairs. And they've, by the grace of God, dragged me and my dad off of him. Mm. <laughs> He's, you never see someone, he didn't touch the floor, the guy, he's, 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 he's just, you ever see like a cat go on the sofa's go, he he flew out the yard so fast and then he ended up getting carried out the yard by someone. He was trying to kick my car on the way out. But yeah, he didn't get his money after that. Fuck it. Quite um, a long question from David Arthur. <laughs> yeah. Do you know the scene in Goodfellas at the end of the movie? Mm -hmm. I do. It's one of my favorite movies. Well, he goes outside to pick up a newspaper in his dressing gown. Yeah. And he's lamenting that he's just an everyday schmuck now. Yeah. Are you happy with life on the straight and narrow now? Or like Henry Hill, <laughs> do you yearn for the glory days? <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, what a <laughs> fucking <laughs> question! <laughs> oh, this nice one, David. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> well, no. Well, what's the glory days, though? Because let We're me tell you something. The glory days. We're here. We're still here. This is the glory. That wasn't the glory. That wasn't the. Gl this is the glory. Being here with you guys, this is the glory. <laughs> they were the dark days. Those are the dark days. Yeah. Those are the yeah, dark days. Yeah. Like, listen, we talk about everything and listen, it might sound glamorizing and gangster and all of that. It's not fun. It's not fun. It's not like, all right, I can understand what you're saying. You got that. We, we still got that thing. We, we, can, we, can, we can go. We can go. But we have to control. <laughs> but we got to control ourselves. We're grown. You understand what I'm saying? And this, and it may, it's because of the person we are. That ain't glory. What, what, what I consider glory. What well, maybe what I considered glory then. <laughs> I don't consider glory now. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, no, I wouldn't strive for them glory day because that's not glory. <laughs> when I think to the shit I did, I look back and I say, Tuggy, you're fucking crazy. <laughs> like even even coming here to talk to you about it, like it's the stuff I try not to talk about. <laughs> it's like you keep like oh, man. it haunts me. Like so when you says, well, I said, oh fuck it, you want the story? I'm gonna give you the stories. <laughs> Like, you want to start giving the stories? <laughs> fuck it. But like, it's not. It's, it's nothing to be proud of. You know what I mean? It's nothing to be proud of. But it's it, like what I said. It's something that you do get on with your life. And this is the glory days now. We, the glory. We Learning have, from them days to get to the glory. <laughs> we have matured from our insanity. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. We've got. We've covered about <laughs> three or four of the stories you said. <laughs> There's like yeah. fifty of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only fifty. <laughs> We're almost out of time. Um, we could keep going in future episodes if you want. Yeah, I'd love. But that. is there one or two stories you feel that you really want to do tonight that we we could we could finish on? It might be. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Is that hey. Is that yeah, you're right. Then I'll tell you about me partying That's with me. Christopher Coke. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that one. And Tivoli. Oh, I'll tell you about Yeah, because that night I got shot. Is I got shot at. When he well. jumped over the mic, James, we got to put that one in the trailer. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> when he just jumped over the mic. So that's a good one for your trailer. I went to it. I remember I went New Year's Eve party. First time I, met, I went to Tivoli Gardens to perform. And I met Christopher Colk. He's like, 15 gunmen around him with big machine guns just to go, on, just to go and talk to him just to go near him mm. and because I mash up the crowd they say oh he wants to meet you Dodos his nickname he said Dodos why I meet you so he takes me backstage to go and see him and I'm there and I'm we chilling with it. it was fucking hardcore around there really really hardcore that same night I went to another ghetto around the corner I performed and police shot up the whole event and I'm on stage behind, I've just finished performing and getting shot at by police on the fucking stage hiding behind the fucking speaker oh man it's like, it's an orchestra of gunshots in them areas and you don't feel safe without a gun. That's the only thing like in Jamaica is a lot of, a lot of guns, a lot of crime activity like that. And like I said, you don't feel safe without one, to be honest with you. So you mentioned about the shower posse in the prison. Yeah. After you got out, mm. did you have dealings with the shower posse? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. I, I became friends with a lot of them because they're entwined in the music business in the sense of they do a lot of events. Like I performed at Christopher Coke's event. And then I got to know his one of his right hand man called Popcorn from Tivali. I was friends with his sister. I'd go around there. Um, the Shower Pussy, I knew a lot of people from the Shower Pussy because artists, friends of mine are from the Shower Pussy as well. But I'll, be, I'll tell you something, I don't get involved in any politics at all because I'm not Shower Pussy. I'm not that Pussy. I'm not no Pussy. I'm not gang at all. I'm tug of war. I'm myself. I just respect everybody. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm not here to get... I never have. In Jamaica, things that I stay away from yeah. is politics. I don't get involved in politics arguments. I don't get involved in religious arguments. I don't get involved in racial arguments and something, things like that. It's things I don't get involved in. And that's, I'm not Jamaican. So it's not my place to be involved in these, these um, parties. It's their, their politics is between themselves because of the issues in that country, because of the culture. You understand what I'm saying? Now I know both sides because I know people from the shower party and I know people from the opposition and I know people from me. I know all sorts. You know, they are they are who they are, and I, I respect everybody and you just treat everybody how how everyone is. Everyone's the same. You understand what I mean? I never got too tied up with any gangs. Someone did ask about religion. Yeah. So, is there like religious services in prison? Yeah. In Jamaica? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what's, how's that then? You can go church every Sunday. My barber was the leader of the church in prison, so you can go church every Sunday. Okay. In the prison. Yeah, yeah there is um, religious servi services in prison, of course. Um, and is that where everybody gets together from different parts of the prison and they can switch contraband and share stories? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's what it was like when we was. <laughs> really? Yeah. I never actually went. Okay. I never actually went. I didn't I didn't see many people go either, to be honest with you. There are two sections, the, the, the prison, um, sorry, the church section and the music section, because Jamaica's a very Christian country. You know, it's a very religious country as well. So they've got that in the prisons over there yeah. as well, of course. Um, but I didn't really, I didn't, I, I never went. I didn't even get to see it, to be honest with you. I didn't really trust anything like that. I just, better the devil you know than the devil you don't. You understand? Because they, they would bring musicians into our religious yeah, services. Yeah, oh, in the services. Yeah. Oh. Like church on the street, had this guy called Jumping Bill with his guitar. Oh, and everybody wicked. was pogo dancing and everything. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> the guard shit themselves thought it was going to be a riot. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. People's ideas were flying off and people were throwing sandals across the room. Wow. Whole room pogo dancing. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in the Spanish town, they'd have artists come in to perform. Yeah. Like on the stage. Remember I said, <laughs> <coughs> remember the stage show I did? Yeah. From the yeah, first yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is like everyone on our section. 1800 people all on our section mm. from all around the prison on our section people. like with all the bands set up the speakers the the um it's crazy yeah. crazy like and the warders even are watching the show everyone's watching the show it's, it's really nice everyone there but women and did everybody just chill that there wasn't any tension no it was really chill that day the music i'll tell you something that's like that uh, music keeps the place sane Music really keeps the place sane, man. I don't think, I think, I think without music in Spanish Town Prison or anywhere, any prison in Jamaica, it's, I think you'd have a lot more. It's really bad, but it would be really worse. Music really keeps people sane over there. Because you go back to your cell on a high, don't you have to be in it somewhere totally, like that? Totally. And everybody's like. I remember today the buzz of coming off of that stage and going back to my cell. I remember Sean Paul's father coming up to me and telling me, remember I told you he come up to me. I remember that whole, I remember the buzz, you're on a high. Everyone's happy. The whole like music uplifts and, and and the whole prison was respecting me after that because they realized, oh, he's an artist. So artists get a different kind of respect. You understand what I'm saying? So like when they realize I'm an artist, it's like it was a whole thing. Oh, you're an artist. It's like you're when you're an artist, you're a voice for the people, you know? So you, 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 it's it's deep like that. So it's like you're speaking for them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a nice way to fit in. Very, very nice yeah. way to fit in. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very nice way to fit in. Because like that even probably made me who I was in the prison because of my music skills as well. You understand what I'm saying? Because people who can't fit in one way or the other, it doesn't end well for them usually. No, it doesn't. I saw it like I saw a lot of foreigners over there have a really hard time. And I looked at them and I really felt sorry for them because I could see it's just a culture shock for them. Yeah. Were they mostly smugglers? You know, yes. Yes. 
they were most, I think all of them, I didn't see many foreigners that wasn't smuggled. Most of them were smugglers. Most of the foreign, there was, there was other charges as well, of course, but like most of them were smugglers. And a lot of them had a really hard time because they're not used to the, it's a whole culture shock for them. They're not used to the surroundings, the, the, the language barrier as well. A lot of them, the patwa, not people don't, no patwa as good as I do, for instance. You, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, I haven't been grown up around Jamaicans, not ex not so much experience with Jamaican people. So they're automatically going to find it a bit harder Yeah. in the prison straight away. And it's not their fault. They just don't. You understand what I'm saying? I've yeah. seen a lot of that. I've seen a lot of that. I've seen some guys in there. Like I see one guy doing about seven, eight years for coke. Lovely guy. Guy from London. Really cool. Just try to keep himself to himself. And he was there like three, four years before I got there. But you can see, still, like, I was comfortable after two weeks. This guy's still not comfortable. He's there for years more than me. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm after two weeks, I'm comfortable, and he ain't because of, he's just not used to this. And I, he's not. It's a whole culture shock for him. It, it, it's a whole barrier. Yeah. You you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Did yes. you make many friends in prison? Many. Yeah. Oh, many. Like solid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Even people that I still talk to up to today. Okay. Yeah, even people I still talk to up to today. Yeah, many friends. Yeah, many many friends. Like it's a university of life. Like even I made people in met people in prison that changed my life. Like Garth Henriquez, R.I.P. He's the one that arranged for me to stay in Jamaica. You know, so many pe people. A lot of good people. Yeah, a lot of good people. Yeah, definitely. It's so intense. It's like you feel bonded with them. Because they're the only ones who understand it, really. You do. Yeah. You do. Even though you can tell the story. That's right. It's like people in the military say when it's so intense, they're bonded with their people. That's yeah. right. Prisoners as well, it's so dangerous mm -hmm. at times, yeah. You really do bond with them. Like, yeah. I was, I kept in contact with a lot of my cellmates after I left yeah. as well. Send them money, things I had to look after them. And I was doing that for a while. And um, I still even, even up to recent years, keep... I have ins and outs of people that was there when I was there and keep in contact where you can. And then you move on with your life. You don't want to keep dwelling on the past as well. So you do have to yeah. move on with your life as well, so to speak. But yeah, you do you do really bond with these people. You do really bond with them, absolutely. Like my cellmates and many people in there. You, they, they're the only ones who can really relate to you because they was in the same position as you. Yeah. You understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, totally. So you're, you're, yeah. you're all in hell together. <laughs> basically, yeah, basically. <laughs> and that's what Jamaican prisons refer to as hell yeah it's referred to as hell yeah, yeah. that's what they call it hell so I so say you're going to hell really the place, that's what they say you're going um. there hell <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. alright so finishing this then what do you want to say to the people um, in conclusion and yeah. like having read all the comments and the feedback and the love that's come in from part one? Oh. I'm, I'm blown away by the by the feedback and the comments it's just you guys are amazing man and to all of you guys that said that you've checked out the interview and you've gone to check out my music that just makes me feel so happy because like like what I said I've worked my whole life for my music career and my story is a lot to do with my path so when people can un understand the story they can understand yeah of who I am and what I stand for more than just seeing this white guy doing reggae music you understand what I'm saying? And just think, oh, wh why does he sound like that? Why is he like that? But now this this platform has given me a chance for a lot of people that not even know about me before to know that. And big up everybody who's come over to my YouTube channel, subscribed, many lovely comments on the on the YouTube because the, the feedback's just been phenomenal. It has, it has it's like, just been yeah, amazing, Sean, really nothing, amazing. Nothing but love and nothing support. Nothing but love and support, yeah, man. It's yeah. been phenomenal. And we appreciate you joining the chat on the day of the premiere as well. That was fun. No, nah, definitely. Yeah, that was mad yeah, fun. That was mad yeah. fun. And I love to see people's questions and that. Like, like what I said from the beginning, like for me to, to share these stories with the people and then for them to feel it like that, it's amazing because it's all from the heart. It's all real shit. And it's really, it touches me for you guys to feel it. You understand what I'm saying? And I appreciate the love from everybody. I really appreciate it. It just goes so fast every time I said it at the end of the last I one. I can't believe it. It's I know. Really fast, isn't it? You're yeah. such a good speaker. So charismatic. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and it just it's it's amazing every time. Yeah. So please support yeah. Tug of War. All the links will be in the description box below this video. Jen's links will be down there as well if you want some non smuggling <laughs> organic yeah. organic yeah. clothing. <laughs> Do not put in a suitcase to Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs>
Don't Jen, do that. Jen is not involved in manufacturing shoes of any kind that Pablo Escobar would use. No, no, not, <laughs> them fl- not, them, not even the flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> Huge thank you also to Claudio for sending me these shirts. Wow, See, look at that. These shirts. I mean, look at the colored buttons on these. Oh, no, I like that. The, de- the detail. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, the links will be down there in the description box. Huge thanks to Joe and James coming out filming. And John and James, bless <laughs> up. <laughs> the links are always in the description box as well if you need to hire a sound engineer or a cameraman. So huge thank you to the new subscribers. Can't wait to read the comments on this one. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. And let's give us a hug, man. <laughs> yes, yeah, my yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah, well done, well, brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank, well, thank you. We have, to, we have to do part three now. We've got to do part yes, three. Totally. Oh, Jen, thank you so much. Lovely to meet you as well. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you so much. It's been a really entertaining. Here at Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Jen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on organic cotton clothing dot co dot uk